Chapter 17. Tessa. Hardin and my father are both seated at the kitchen table, when I emerge from the bathroom, Hardin's phone in hand. I'm wilting away here, babe, Hardin says when I reach them. My father looks over sheepishly. I could eat he begins, like he's unsure. I place my hands on the top of Hardin's chair, and he leans his head back, his damp hair touching my fingers. Then I suggest you make yourself something to eat, I say and place his phone in front of him. He looks up at me with a completely neutral expression. Okay he says and gets up, and goes to the refrigerator. Are you hungry, he asks. I have my leftovers from Applebee's. Are you upset with me about taking him drinking today, my father asks. I look over at him, and soften my tone. I could tell what my dad was like when I invited him in. I'm not upset, but I don't want it to become a regular thing. It won't. Besides, you're moving, he reminds me, and I look across the table at the man I've only known for two days now. I don't reply. Instead I join Hardin at the fridge, and pull the freezer door open. What do you want to eat? I ask him. He looks at me with wary eyes, clearly trying to assess my mood. Just some chicken or something, or we can order some takeout. I sigh. Let's just order something. I don't mean to be short with him, but my mind is whirling with possibilities, of what was on his phone, that he felt needed to be deleted. Once ordering food becomes the plan, Hardin and my father begin bickering over Chinese or pizza. Hardin wants pizza, and he wins the argument, by reminding my father who will be paying for it. For his part, my father doesn't seem offended by Hardin's digs. He just laughs or flips him off. It's a strange sight, really, to watch the two of them. After my father left, I would often daydream about him, when I saw my friends with their fathers. I had created a vision of a man who resembled the man I grew up with, only older, and definitely not. The homeless drunk. I had always thought of him carrying an attaché case stuffed with important documents, walking to his car in the morning, coffee mug in hand. I didn't imagine he'd still be drinking, that he'd be ravaged by it like he's been, and that he'd be without a place to live. I can't picture my mother and this man being able to hold a conversation, let alone spending years married to each other. How did you and my mother meet? I say, suddenly voicing my thoughts. In high school, he answers. Hardin grabs his phone and leaves the room to order the pizza. Either that or to call someone, and then quickly delete the call log. I sit at the kitchen table across from my father. How long were you dating before you got married? I ask. Only about two years. We got married young. I feel uncomfortable asking these questions, but I know I wouldn't have any luck getting the answers from my mother. Why? You and your mom never talked about this? He asks. No. We never talked about you. If I even tried to bring the subject up, she shut down, I tell him, and watch his features transform from interest to shame. Oh. Sorry, I say, though I'm not sure what I'm apologizing for. No, I get it. I don't blame her. He closes his eyes for a moment, before opening them again. Hardin strolls back into the kitchen, and sits down next to me. To answer your question, we got married young because she got pregnant with you, and your grandparents hated me, and tried to keep her away from me. So we got hitched. He smiles, enjoying the memory. Do you got married to spite my grandparents? I ask with a smile. My grandparents, may they rest in peace, were a little intense. Very intense. My childhood memories of them include being shushed at the dinner table for laughing, and being told to take my shoes off before walking on their carpet. For birthdays, they would send an impersonal card with a 10-year savings bond inside, not an ideal gift for an 8-year-old. My mother was essentially a clone of my grandmother, only slightly less poised. She tried, though. My mother spends her days and nights trying to be as perfect as she remembers her own mother being. Or, I suddenly think, as perfect as she imagines her being. My father laughs. In a way, yes, to piss them off but your mother always wanted to be married. She practically dragged me to the altar. He laughs again, and Hardin looks at me, before laughing as well. I scowl at him, knowing he's concocting some snarky comment about me forcing him into marriage. I turn back to my dad. Were you against marriage? I ask. No. 
I don't remember, really. All I know is I was scared as hell to have a baby at 19. And rightfully so. We can see how that worked out for you, Hardin remarks. I shoot him a glare, but my father only rolls his eyes at him. It's not something I recommend, but there are a lot of young parents that can handle it. He lifts his hands up in resignation. I just wasn't one of them. Oh, I say. I can't imagine being a parent at my age. He smiles, clearly open to giving me what answers he can. Any more questions, Tessie? No, I think that's all, I say. I don't exactly feel comfortable around him, though in a strange way I feel more comfortable than I would if my mother were sitting here instead of him. If you think of any more, you can ask me. Until then, do you mind if I take another shower before dinner comes? Of course not. Go ahead, I say. It seems like he's been here longer than two days. So much has happened since he appeared, Hardin's expulsion no expulsion, Zed's appearance in the parking lot, my lunch with Steph and Molly, the ever-disappearing call log, just too much. This overstressful, constantly growing pile of issues in my life doesn't appear to be letting up anytime soon. What's wrong? Hardin asks when my father disappears down the hall. Nothing. I stand up and take a few steps before he stops me by touching my waist and turning me around to face him. I knew you better than that. Tell me what's wrong, he softly demands, placing both hands on my hips. I look him dead in the eyes. You. I what? Talk, he demands. You're acting weird, and you deleted your text messages and calls. His features twist in annoyance, and he pinches the bridge of his nose. Why would you be looking through my phone, anyway? Because you're acting suspicious, and, so you go through my shit? Didn't I tell you before not to do that? The look of indignation on his face is so brazen, looks so practiced, that my blood gets boiling. I know I shouldn't be going through your things, but you shouldn't give me a reason to. And if you don't have anything to hide, why would you care? I wouldn't mind, if you look through my phone. I have nothing to hide. I dig mine out of my pocket, and hold it out. Then I start to worry that maybe I didn't delete the text from Zed on there and I panic, until Hardin waves it away like my trust is in that. You're just making up excuses for how psychotic you are, he says, his words burning me. I don't have anything to say. Well, actually, I have a lot to say to him, but no words come from my mouth. I push his hands from my hips and storm off. He said he knows me well enough to sense when something's wrong with me. Well, I know him well enough to sense when he's close to being caught at something. Whether it be a small lie or a bet for my virginity, the same thing happens each time. First he acts suspicious, then when I bring it up to him, he gets angry and defensive, and finally he spits harsh words at me. Don't walk away from me, he bellows from behind me. Don't follow me, I say and disappear into the bedroom. But he appears in the doorway a second later. I don't like you going through my shit. I don't like feeling like I have to. He closes the door and leans his back against it. You don't have to. I deleted that stuff because it was an accident. It's nothing for you to be all worked up over. Worked up? Do you mean psychotic? He sighs. I didn't really mean that. Then stop saying things you don't mean. Because then I can't tell what's true and what's not. Then stop going through my shit. Because then I can't tell if I should trust you or not. Fine. I sit down at the desk. Fine, he repeats and sits down on the bed. I can't decide if I believe him or not. Nothing adds up, but in a way it does. Maybe he did delete the texts and calls by accident, and maybe he was talking to Steph on the phone. The bits and pieces of the conversation that I caught fuel my imagination, but I don't want to ask Hardin about it because I don't want him to know I overheard them. It's not like he'd tell me what they talked about anyway. I don't want there to be secrets between us. We should be past that, I remind him. I know, fuck. There aren't any secrets, you're being crazy. Stop calling me crazy. You of all people, shouldn't be calling anyone that. I regret the words, as soon as they're out, but he doesn't seem phased. I'm sorry, okay? You're not crazy, he says, then smiles. You just go through my phone. I force a smile in return, 
and try to convince myself that he's right, that I'm being paranoid. Worst case scenario, he's hiding something from me. I'll find out eventually, so there isn't any point in obsessing over it now. I found out everything else. I mentally repeat the logic over and over until I'm convinced. My father yells something from the other room, and Hardin says, I think the pizza's here. You're not going to be mad at me all night, are you? But he leaves the room without giving me a chance to answer. I swivel on my seat and look at where I laid my phone on the desk. Curious, I check it, and sure enough, I have another new text from Zed. I don't bother to read it this time. The next day is my last at the old office, and I drive slower than usual to work. I want to take in every street, every building on the way. This paid internship has been a dream come true. I know I'll be working for Vance in Seattle, but this area is where it started, where my career started. Kimberly is sitting at her desk when I step off the elevator. Multiple brown boxes are stacked near the side of her desk. Good morning, she chirps. Good morning. My voice is incapable of sounding as cheery as hers. I'd come off nervous and awkward. Ready for your last week here, she asks as I fill a small styrofoam cup with coffee. Yes, my last day, actually. I'm going on a trip for the rest of the week, I remind her. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Wow. Your last day. I should have gotten you a card or something. She smiles. But then, I could just give it to you next week at your new office. I laugh. Are you ready to go? When will you be leaving? Friday. Our new house is already unpacked and ready for us to arrive. I'm quite certain that Kimberly and Christian's new home is lovely, large, and modern, much like the house they're moving from. Kimberly's engagement ring sparkles under the light, and I can't help but stare at the beautiful band every time I see it. I'm still waiting for the woman to call me back about my apartment, I tell her, and she turns to look at me. What? You don't have an apartment yet? I do. I sent her the paperwork already. We just have to go over the details of the lease. Do you only have six days, Kimberly says, looking panicked for me. I know, I have it under control, I assure her, hoping it's true. If this had been happening a few months ago, I'd have had every detail of this move planned, but lately I've been too stressed to focus on anything, even the move to Seattle. Okay, if you need help, just let me know. She offers as she turns her attention to the phone ringing on her desk. When I get back to my office, there are a few empty boxes on the floor. I don't have many personal items, so it shouldn't take long to pack. Twenty minutes later, as I take the last box closed, there's a gentle knock at the door. Come in, I say loudly. For a moment I wonder if it's Hardin, but when I turn around Trevor is standing in the doorway wearing light jeans and a plain white t-shirt. I'm always caught off guard when he's dressed casually. I'm so used to seeing him in a suit. Are you ready for the big move? He asks as I attempt to lift a box that I packed too full. Yeah, almost. Are you? He walks over and picks up the box for me, placing it on the desk. Thanks. I smile and wipe my hands on the sides of my green dress. I am. I'm heading out today, as soon as I finish up here. That's amazing. I know you've been ready to move to Seattle since last time we were there. I can feel embarrassment spread over my cheeks as I watch it spread across his. Last time we were there, Trevor took me to a nice dinner, only to have me reject his kiss, and then later be threatened and shoved by Hardin. I have no idea why I just brought that up. He looks at me blankly. That was an interesting weekend. Anyway, I know you have to be pumped too. You've always wanted to live in Seattle. Yeah, I can't wait. Trevor looks around my office. I know it's none of my business, but is Hardin moving to Seattle with you? No. My mouth answers before my mind can catch up. Well, I'm not sure yet. He says he doesn't want to, but I'm hoping that he'll change his mind I continue to ramble, the words. Coming out quickly, too quickly and Trevor looks somewhat uncomfortable as he shoves his hands into his jean pockets before finally interrupting me. Why wouldn't he want to go with you? I'm not sure, really, but I hope he does. I sigh and sit down in my leather desk chair. Trevor's blue eyes meet mine. He's crazy if he doesn't. 
He's crazy either way. I laugh, trying to diminish the growing tension in the room. He laughs too, and shakes his head. Well, I better finish up, so I can get on the road. But I'll see you in Seattle. With a smile he leaves my office, and for some reason I feel slightly guilty. I reach for my phone and text Hardin, casually letting him know that Trevor stopped by my office. For once, Hardin's jealousy appeals to me, maybe he'll find himself too jealous of Trevor and decide to move to Seattle after all? It doesn't seem likely, but I can't help but hold on to the last thread of hope that he'll change his mind. The clock is running out. Six days is not very long for him to plan. He'd have to put in a transfer request, which shouldn't be a problem, considering Ken's position. Six days doesn't seem long enough for me either, though I'm ready for Seattle. I have to be. This is my future, and I can't center it around Hardin when he isn't willing to compromise. I offered a fair plan, we move to Seattle first, and if it doesn't work out, we can go to England. But he didn't give it a second thought before declining. I'm hoping this whale-watching trip we have planned with his family will make him see that he can join me, Landon, Ken, and Karen in trying new things, that doing something fun and positive isn't too difficult. Then again, this is hard and I'm talking about, and nothing is easy, when it comes to him. The phone on my desk rings, distracting me from my stressful thoughts about Seattle. You have a visitor, Kimberly says into my ear, and my heart leaps at the thought of seeing Hardin. It's only been a few hours, but I always miss him when we're apart. Tell Hardin to come on back. I'm surprised he even waited for you to call me, I say. Kimberly clicks her tongue. Um, it's not Hardin. Maybe Hardin brought my father here? Is it an older man with a beard? No young guy like Hardin, she practically whispers. Does he have bruises on his face? I ask, despite the fact that I already know the answer. Yeah, should I make him leave? I don't want to make her force said to leave, and he hasn't done anything wrong, except to not listen to Hardin's instructions to stay away from me. No, it's fine. He's my friend. You can let him back. Why would he come here? I'm sure it has something to do with me ignoring him but I don't understand what could be so urgent that he'd drive 40 minutes to tell me. I hang up the phone and debate whether or not to text Hardin and tell him about Zed's arrival. I toss my phone into my desk drawer and close it. Nearly the last thing I need is for Hardin to come here since he won't be able to control his anger and will surely cause a scene on my last day at work. The last thing I need is for him to get arrested again. Chapter 18 Tessa. When I pull open the door to my office, Zed is standing in the hall like the angel of death. He's dressed in a black and red plaid sweatshirt, dark jeans, and sneakers. The swelling on his face hasn't gone down much, but the bruising around the edges of his eyes and nose have lightened from dark purple to a greenish blue. Hey I'm sorry for coming here like this, he says. Is something wrong? I ask and walk back over to my desk. He stands awkwardly in the doorway for a moment, before stepping into the room. No. Well, yes, I've been trying to talk to you since yesterday, but you haven't been answering my texts. I know. It's just that Hardin and I already have enough issues without me creating even more, and he doesn't want me to talk to you anymore. Do you letting him tell you who you can talk to now? Zed sits down in the chair directly in front of my desk, and I take a seat behind it. The way we're seated gives an official, more serious tone to our conversation. It's not uncomfortable, just too formal. I look out the window before answering. No, it's not like that. I know he's a little overbearing and may go about things the wrong way, but I can't say I blame him for not wanting me to be friends with you anymore. I wouldn't want him to spend time with someone he has feelings for either, I say, and Zed's eyes widen. What did you say? Damn it. Nothing, I just meant the air grows thick, and I could swear that the walls are closing in on me. Why did I just say that? Not that it isn't true, but it won't help the situation here. You have feelings for me, he asks, his eyes lighting up with each syllable. No well, I did. I don't know, I ramble, wishing I could slap myself for being so quick to speak without thinking. It's okay if you don't, but you shouldn't have to lie about it. I'm not lying. I did have feelings for you. 
I may still have some, honestly, but I don't know. It's all confusing to me. You always say the right things, and you've always been there for me. It would make sense, if I did develop those feelings. I've told you before, that I care about you, but we both know it's a lost cause. Was that, he asks. I'm not sure how many more times I can reject him, before he understands where I'm coming from. Because it's pointless. I'll never be able to be with you. Or anyone, for that matter. No one but him. You're only saying that, because he has you trapped. I try to push down the anger, that is slowly building as I listen to Zed's words about Hardin. He's certainly entitled to have ill feelings toward him, but I don't like the way he's insinuating that I have no power or control when it comes to my relationship. No, I'm saying that because I love him. And as much as I don't want to say it that boldly to you right now, I know that I have to. I don't want to lead you on more than I already have. I know you don't understand why I stay with him through all of this mess, but I love him so much, more than anything, and he doesn't have me trapped. I want to be with him. It's true. Everything I just said to Zed is true. Whether Hardin comes to Seattle with me or not, we can try to make it work. We can use Skype, see each other on the weekends until he goes to England. Hopefully by then he won't want to be away from me after all. Maybe the distance will make Hardin's heart grow fonder, his tone softer. It may be the key to getting him to agree to move with me. Our history has proven that we aren't very good at staying away from one another, whether deliberately or not, we always end up together in some way. It's hard to remember a time when my days and nights didn't revolve around this man. I've tried again and again to picture a life without him, but it's nearly impossible. I don't think he gives you the chance to really think about what you want or what's good for you, Zed says with conviction, though his voice does crack. He only cares about himself. And that's where you're wrong. I know you guys have some issues between the two of you, but, no, you don't know about our issues at all, he says quickly. If you did, he loves me, and I him, I interrupt. I'm sorry that you were brought into the middle of this. I'm so sorry, I never wanted to hurt you. He frowns. You keep saying that to me, and yet it keeps happening. I hate confrontation more than anything, especially when it involves hurting someone that I care for, but these things have to be said, so that Zed and I can close the book on this, I'm not even sure how to categorize it. Situation? Misunderstanding? Bad timing? I look at Zed, hoping he can read the sincerity in my eyes. It wasn't my intention. I'm sorry. You don't have to keep apologizing. I already knew this, when I made the decision to come here. You made it pretty clear how you felt outside of the administration building. Then why did you come? I ask softly. To talk to you. He looks around the room, then back at me. Never mind. I don't know why I came here, really. He sighs. Are you sure? Do you seem pretty determined a few minutes ago? No. It's pointless, like you said. I'm sorry for coming. It's okay, you don't have to apologize, I tell him. We both keep saying that, I think. He points down at the boxes on the floor. You're still going, then? Yeah, I'm almost ready to leave. The air between us has become incredibly thick, and neither of us seems to know what to say to the other. Zed stares out the window at the gray sky, and I stare at the carpet beyond him. At last he stands up and speaks, though I can barely hear his words through the sadness in his voice. I better go, then. Sorry again for coming here. Good luck in Seattle, Tessa. I stand up as well. I'm sorry for everything. I wish things could have been different. So do I. More than you know, he says and stands up from the chair. My heart aches for him. He's always been so sweet to me, and I've done nothing but lead him on and reject him. Have you made up your mind whether you're going to press charges or not? This isn't the right time to be asking this but I don't think I'll ever see or hear from him again. Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm over this whole thing. There's no point in dragging it out. And I did tell you that, if you told me you didn't want to see me again I would drop them, didn't I? Suddenly I feel like, if Zed just looks at me in a certain way, I'll probably start crying. Yeah, I quietly respond. 
I feel like Estella in great expectations, toying with Pip's emotions. My own Pip stands in front of me, caramel eyes fixed on mine. And this is a role I don't really want to play. I truly am sorry for everything. I wish we could be friends, I say. Me too, but you're not allowed to have friends. He sighs, running his fingers over his bottom lip, pinching it in the middle. I decide not to comment on his statement, this isn't about what I'm allowed to do. I do, however, make a mental note to discuss this perception that other people have with Hardin and make sure he understands that it bothers me, that his attitude makes them think this about me. As if on cue, my office phone rings, breaking the silence between Zed and me. I hold my finger, so he doesn't leave and pick it up. Tessa. Hardin's rough voice carries through. Shit. Hey, I say, my voice shaky. Are you alright? Yeah, I'm fine. You don't sound fine, he says. Why does he have to know me so well? I'm fine, I assure him again. Just distracted. Sure. Anyway, I need to know what you want me to do with your dad. I tried to text, but you weren't answering me. I've got shit to do, and I don't know if I should leave him here, or what. I look over at said. He's standing by the window now, not looking at me. I don't know, can you take him with you? My heart is racing. No. Hell, no. So leave him there, I say, just wanting this conversation to end. I'm going to tell Hardin about Zed's visit, but I can't imagine how pissed he would be if he knew he was here now, and I sure as hell don't want him to find out. Fine, you can deal with him when you get here. Okay, well, I'll see you when I get home, music begins to play through my office, and it takes me a minute to realize it's coming from Zed. He reaches into his pocket and silences it, but not before Hardin notices. What was that? Whose phone was that, he demands. My blood suddenly runs cold, until I take a moment to think about this. I shouldn't be so afraid, or nervous for Hardin to know Zed's here. I didn't do anything wrong. He came, and he's leaving. He already gets irritated, when Trevor comes by my office, and Trevor's a co-worker and entitled to stop in any time he wants. Is fucking Trevor there? No, it's not Trevor. Zed's here, I say and hold my breath. The line is silent. I look at the screen to make sure the call is still connected. Harden? Yeah, he says and lets out a ragged breath. Did you hear me? Yes, Tessa, I heard you. Okay? Why isn't he screaming through the phone, or threatening to kill him yet? We'll talk about it later. Make him leave. Please, he calmly requests. Okay, thank you. I'll see you when you get home, Hardin says and hangs up the phone. When I put my phone down, slightly bewildered, Zed turns to me and says, Sorry, I know he's going to freak out on you. No, he won't. He'll be fine, I say back, knowing it's not true, but it sounds good, anyway. Hardin's reaction to Zed, being in my office caught me off guard. I'd never have expected him to be so calm. I expected him to say he was on his way here. I sure hope he's not. Zed walks toward the door again. Okay. Well, I guess I should go. Zed, thank you for coming by. I probably won't see you again before I leave. He turns, and emotion flashes in his eyes, but it disappears, before I can decide which emotion it was. I won't say meeting you hasn't complicated my life, but I wouldn't take it back. I'd go through all of this shit again, the fights with Hardin, the friendships I've lost, all of it. I would go through it again, for you, he says. I guess it's just my luck. Of course I can't meet a girl who doesn't already love someone else. His words always get to me, always. He's so sincere all the time, and I admire that about him. Bye, Tessa, he says. His words hold much more than a simple friendly goodbye, but I can't project too much into them. If I say the wrong thing, or anything at all, I'll only be leading him on, again. Bye Zed. I half smile, and he takes a step toward me. For a moment I panic, thinking he's going to kiss me, but he doesn't. He wraps his arms around me in a strong, but brief hug, before placing a light kiss on my forehead. He steps away immediately after and grabs hold of the door handle, almost like it's a cane. Be careful, 
Okay, he says, opening the door. I will. Seattle isn't too bad. I smile. I feel very resolved now, like I have finally given him the closure he needed. He frowns and turns to leave the room. As he closes the door behind him, I hear him say gently, I'm not talking about Seattle. Chapter 19. Tessa. As soon as the door shuts and Zed is gone, gone for good, I close my eyes and lay my head back against the chair. I don't know what I'm feeling. All of my emotions are jumbled, swirling around me in a cloud of confusion. Part of me feels relieved to end this back and forth between Zed and me. But another smaller part feels a significant loss. Zed is the only one of heart and so-called friends who's been there for me constantly, and it's strange to realize that I'll never see him again. The tears burn, unwelcomed, down my cheeks as I try to collect myself. I shouldn't be crying over this. I should be happy that I can finally close the book on Zed, tuck it away, leaving it only to collect. Dust, never to be opened again. It's not that I want to be with him, it's not that I love him, it's not that I would ever choose him over Hardin, it's just that I do care for him, and I wish things had played out differently. I wish I would have kept our relationship strictly platonic, maybe then I wouldn't have to completely cut him out of my life. I don't know why he came back in here, but I'm glad he left, before he could say anything to confuse me, or hurt Hardin further. My office phone rings, and I clear my throat before answering. When I say hello, I sound pathetic. Hardin's voice carries through strong and clear. Did he leave? Yeah. Are you crying? I'm just I start. What, he implores. I don't know, I'm just glad it's over. I wipe at my eyes again. He sighs through the line and surprises me by simply saying, me too. The tears are no longer falling, but my voice is hideous. Thank you, I pause for being understanding about this. That went much better than I'd expected, and I don't know if I should be relieved or slightly worried. I decide to go with relieved and finish the last of my time advance as peacefully as possible. Around three, Kimberly stops by my office. Behind her is a girl who I'm sure I've never seen at the office before. Tessa, this is Amy, my replacement, Kimberly says, introducing the quiet yet stunning girl. I get up from where I'm reading, trying to reassure Amy with a friendly smile. Hi Amy. I'm Tessa. You love it here. Thank you. I already love it, she says excitedly. Kim laughs. Well, I just wanted to stop by your office while we were pretending to be taking a tour of the building. Oh yes. You're teaching her to replace you, all right, I tease. Hey. Being engaged to the boss has its perks. Kim jokes back. Beside her, Amy laughs, and then Kimberly leads her down another hallway. My last day here finally ends, and I find myself wishing it could have gone slower. I'm going to miss this place, and I'm slightly nervous to go home to Hardin. I take one last look around my first office. My eyes focus on the desk first. My stomach tightens as memories of Hardin and me on the desk flood my senses. It seems so extreme having sex in an office, when anyone could walk in at any moment. I was too distracted by Hardin to think of anything else which seems to be a pattern in my everyday life. On the way home I stopped by Connor's to get a few groceries, just enough to make dinner tonight, since we're leaving in the morning. I'm excited but nervous about the trip. I hope Hardin can keep his temper in check for the two-day vacation with his family. Since that doesn't seem likely, my next hope is that the boat is big enough for the five of us to have a little breathing room. Back at the apartment, I unlock the front door and push it open with my foot, picking up the grocery bags from the floor as I step inside. The living room is a mess. Empty water bottles and food wrappers litter the coffee table. My father and Hardin sit on opposite ends of the couch. How was your day, Tessie? My father asks, craning his neck to look over at me. Good. It was my last day there, I tell him, even though he already knows. I begin to clear their trash from the table and floor. I'm happy you had a good day, my father says. I look at Hardin, who doesn't look at me. His gaze is fixed on the television screen. I'm going to make dinner, then get in the shower, I tell them, and my father follows me into the kitchen. As I unload the grocery bags 
and put the ground beef and box of taco shells on the counter, my father watches me with interest. At last, he says, one of my friends, said he can pick me up here later, if that's okay. I know you're leaving tomorrow for a few days. Yeah, that's fine. We can drop you off in the morning, if that would be better for you, I offer. No, you've already been so generous. Just promise me you'll let me know when you get back from your trip. Okay how will I get in touch with you? He rubs the back of his neck. Maybe just drive down Lamar? I'm usually out there. Okay, I will. I'll go call him back now, and let him know I'm ready. He disappears from the kitchen. I hear Hardin teasing my father about the fact that he has to memorize phone numbers because he doesn't own a phone, and I roll my eyes when my father begins the, when I was a kid no one had cell phone speech. Tacos with ground beef are easy to make and don't require too much thought. I wish Hardin would come into the kitchen and talk to me, but I suppose it's better if he waits until my father leaves. I set up the table for dinner and call for the two of them. Hardin enters first, barely making eye contact with me, followed by my father. As he sits, my father says, Chad will be here soon to get me. I appreciate you guys letting me stay. It was mighty generous of you too. He looks back and forth between Hardin and me. Thank you so much, Tessie, H-bomb, he adds. The way Hardin rolls his eyes at my father, I can tell this is some inside joke between them. It's no problem, really, I tell him. I'm just so glad we found each other again, he says and starts eating his meal with an animated ferocity. Me, too I smile, still not able to process that this man is my father. The man that I haven't seen in nine years, the man who I had so many ill feelings toward, is just sitting in my kitchen eating with my boyfriend and me. I look over to Hardin, expecting a rude comment from him, but he says nothing and quietly eats his meal. His silence is driving me mad. I wish he'd just say something anything, really. Sometimes his silence is far worse than his yelling. Chapter 20. Hardin. After we finish eating, Tessa gives her father her final, somewhat stiff goodbye and heads into the bathroom for a shower. I was planning on getting in the shower with her, but Richard's friend is taking all damn night to pick his ass up. Is he coming today or I begin? Richard nods about 20 times, but then looks at the window with a slightly worried expression. Yeah, yeah, he said he'd be here soon. He probably just got lost or something. Sure, I say. He smiles. Won't you miss having me around? I wouldn't go that far. Well, maybe I'll find myself a job and see you both in Seattle. Neither of us will be in Seattle. He looks at me sagely. Sure, he repeats, using my word from moments ago. A knock at the door ends our obnoxious conversation, and as he goes to answer it, I stand up. Just in case he needs an extra little push out the door. Thanks for picking me up. Man, Tessa's dad says to his friend, who remains in the doorway, but peeks his head in farther. He's tall, with long black hair swept back in a disgusting, greasy ponytail. His cheeks are sunken in, his clothes are ratty, and his fingernails are black lines on filthy bony hands. What the fuck? The man's gravelly voice matches his appearance, when he asks with Zama, this is your daughter's place? This man is no drunk. Yeah. Nice, huh? I'm proud of her. Richard smiles, and the guy pats his shoulder, nodding in agreement. Who's this? The man asks. They both look over at me. Richard smiles. Oh, him? That's Hardin, Tessie's boyfriend. Cool, I'm Chad, he states, saying it almost like he's a local personality I should somehow know. Not a drunk. So much worse. Okay, I say watching his eyes as they move around our living room. I'm relieved that Tess is in the shower and doesn't have to meet this creep. When I hear the bathroom door open, I curse at myself. I spoke too fucking soon. Chad lifts his long-sleeved shirt to scratch at his arms, making me feel like Tessa for a moment as I get a sudden urge to mop the fucking floor. Harden? Her voice travels down the hall. You should go now, I tell the scraggly pair before me in the most threatening tone possible. I want to meet her, Chad says with a dark twinkle in his eye, 
and I have to concentrate to keep myself in my place and not throw both these bags of bones into the hallway and out the window. No. You don't, I say. Richard looks at me. Okay okay we're going, he says and starts ushering his friend out. I'll see you later Hardin. Thanks again. Stay out of jail. And with a smirk in that parting shot, he leaves the apartment. Hardin? Tessa calls again as she enters the living room. They just left. What's wrong, she asks. What's wrong? Hmm, let's see. Zed came to your office, and your drunk of a dad just brought some creepy fucking dude into our apartment. A brief pause, and I add, are you sure your dad only drinks? What? The shoulder of her t-shirt, well, my t-shirt, slips down to bare her shoulder. She pushes it back up and sits down on the couch. What do you mean, only drinks? Looking at her, I don't want to plant the seed that her dad's not only a homeless drunk, but a drug addict too. He doesn't look as bad as the asshole who just came to pick him up, but I still have a weird feeling about this shit. Even so, I just say, I don't know. Never mind, I was just thinking out loud. Okay she quietly answers. I know her well enough to be certain that the thought of her father being on drugs hasn't crossed her mind and that she'd never guess I'm thinking it from what I said. Are you mad at me? Her voice is soft, too timid. I know she's waiting for me to explode any moment. I have been purposely avoiding conversation with her for a reason. No. Are you sure? She looks at me with those big, beautiful eyes, begging for me to say something. They do the trick. No, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm really mad, yeah, but I don't want to fight with you over it. I'm trying to change, you know? Keep my shit together and not flip out on you over every little thing. I sigh, rubbing the back of my neck. Even though this isn't a little thing. I've told you time and time again not to see Zed, but you still do. I look at her coldly, not to be mean, but because I have to see how her eyes react when I add, how would you feel if I did that to you? She practically crumbles before my eyes. I would feel terrible. I know I've been wrong for seeing him, she says without defense. Well, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting her to yell at me and stick up for that shithead said, like always. Yes, you have, I say, then sigh. But if you say you told him it's done, then it's done. I've done everything I can do to keep him away from you, but he doesn't stop. So you have to be the one to keep him away. It's done, I swear. I won't see him again. She looks up at me, and I shudder at the thought of her on the phone earlier, her crying over their goodbye. We are going to that party on Saturday, I say, and her face falls. Why not? Because I don't think it's a good idea. Actually, I know it isn't. I want to go. She presses her full lips into a line. We are going, I tell her again. Her spine shoots up a little, and she pushes back. If I want to go, I'll go. Fuck, she's so fucking stubborn. Can we please just discuss it later? We have shit to do, if you want me to go on this fucking stupid ass boat shit. She smiles playfully. Could you fit any more curse words in that sentence? And I smile as I have a vision of her bent over my knee for being so smarmy. She'd probably like that, actually, lying across my lap, my hand hitting her skin, not too hard, just hard enough to turn the skin pink hardened? My perverted thoughts interrupted, I push them away for now. She would hide behind her hands, if I told her, what I was daydreaming about. Chapter 21. Tessa. I shake his arm again, roughly this time. Harden. You have to get up, now. We're going to be late. I'm already dressed and ready, our bags have already been placed in the car, and I've given him as much time to sleep as possible. Heck, last night I even did all the packing, not that he would have done a very good job of it anyway. Not going, he groans. Please get up. I whine and tug at his arm. God, I wish he was a morning person like me. He covers his face with a pillow, and I grab it and toss it onto the floor. No, go away. I decide to take a different approach and bring my hand to the front of his boxers. He fell asleep in his jeans last night, and I had a hell of a time tugging them down his legs without waking him. But now he's been left vulnerable and manipulable. 
My fingernails gently graze the ink skin just above the waistband he doesn't budge. I dip my hand fully into his boxers, and he opens his eyes. Good morning, he says with a lusty smile. I remove my hand and stand up. Get up. He yawns dramatically, and looks down at his boxers and says, looks like I already am. When he doesn't look back up, I see he's pretending to be asleep again, and soon he starts making loud cartoon snoring noises. It's inconvenient, but adorable and playful. I hope he remains this way for the rest of the week, really, I'll settle for the rest of the day. I reach into his boxers again, and when his eyes pop open to look at me like an eager puppy, I say, uh-uh, and pull my hand back out. Not fair, he whines. But he does get up, pulling yesterday's jeans back on. He walks over to the dresser and grabs a black shirt, looks at me, then puts it back and pulls out a white one. He runs his fingers through his hair, making it stand straight up before pushing it back down. Do I have time to brush my teeth? His tone is sarcastic, and his voice is raspy from sleep. Yes, hurry up. Brush your teeth, so we can go. I instruct and do a quick walkthrough of the apartment to make sure everything is in order. Minutes later, Hardin joins me in the living room, and we finally leave. Ken, Karen, and Landon are waiting for us in the driveway when we arrive. I roll down the window. Sorry we were a few minutes late, I apologize as we pull up next to where they stand. It's okay. We figured we'd all ride together since it's quite a drive, Karen says with a smile. Fuck, no, Hardin whispers next to me. Come on. She gestures to the black SUV filling the other. Half of the driveway. Kim bought me this for my birthday, and we never use it. No, hell, no, Hardin says a little louder. It'll be fine, I say quietly, to him. Tessa he begins. Hardin, please don't make this difficult please, I beg. Maybe, just maybe, I blink my eyes seductively, hoping that will work. After looking at me for a moment, his eyes finally soften. Fine. Fuck, you're lucky I love you. I squeeze his hand. Thank you. Then I turn back to Karen. Okay, I say with a smile and turn off my car. Hardin puts her bags into the back of Karen's SUV, sculling the whole time. This is going to be fun. Landon laughs as I climb into the car. Hardin sits next to me in the back row, after making a comment about not having to sit next to Landon. As Ken pulls onto the street, Karen turns on the radio, and begins to sing along softly. This is some shit straight from a corny comedy, Hardin says and puts his hand over mine, before pulling them both to his lap. Chapter 22. Tessa. Wisconsin. Karen says loudly, clapping her hands together, then pointing at a passing truck. I can't help but laugh at Hardin's horrified expression. Oh my fucking god, he huffs, laying his head back on the seat. Would you stop? She's having fun, I scold him. Texas. Landon calls out. Just open the door and I'll jump out here, Hardin adds. So dramatic, I tease and look over at him. So she plays the license plate game? I think you could relate, you and your friends seem awful fond of silly games too, like truth or dare. Before Hardin can say something smart back, Karen exclaims, we're so excited for you too, to see the boat in the cabin. I look over at her. Cabin? I ask. Yeah, we have a small cabin on the water there. I think you'll like it, Tessa, she says. I'm so relieved to find that I won't have to sleep on the boat, like I'd assumed. I'm hoping the sun stays out, this weather is nice for February. It's even better in the summer. Maybe we can all come back? Ken asks, looking in the rearview mirror. Yeah, Landon and I answer in unison. Hardin rolls his eyes. Apparently he's going to stick to his patty, childlike persona for the remainder of the drive. Do you have everything ready for Seattle, Tessa? Ken asks. I spoke with Christian yesterday, and he's really looking forward to you coming. I feel Hardin's eyes on me, but I'm not going to let that stop me. I plan to start packing when we get back, but I've already enrolled in my classes at the new campus, I tell him. That campus is nothing compared to mine, Ken teases, and Karen laughs. No, it really is a nice campus. If you have any trouble, let me know. I smile, 
happy to have him on my side. Thank you, I will. Come to think of it, he goes on, we're getting a new professor from the Seattle campus next week. He's replacing one of our religion professors. Oh, which one? Landon asks, looking at me with a raised brow. Soto, the young one. Ken looks in the rearview mirror again. He's your professor right now, isn't he? Yeah, he is, Landon answers. I don't remember where he's going, but I think he's transferring out, Ken says. Good thing, Landon remarks under his breath, but I catch it and smile at him. Neither one of us really likes Professor Soto's style and lack of academic rigor. Though I did enjoy the journaling he had us do. Karen's voice is soft, and it slides between my thoughts. Do the two of you have a place already? No. I had an apartment, or so I thought, but the woman seems to have dropped off the face of the earth. It was perfect too, right in my budget and close to the office, I tell her. Hardin shifts a little beside me, and I want to add that he isn't joining me in Seattle, but I'm hoping to use this trip to convince him otherwise, so I stay quiet. You know, Tessa, I have a few friends in Seattle. I can see about getting you a place before Monday, if you'd like, Ken offers. No, Hardin says quickly. I look over at him. Actually, I would like that, I say and meet Ken's reflected gaze. Otherwise I'll be spending a fortune staying at a hotel until I can find a place. Hardin waves his dad off. It's fine. I'm sure Sandra will call her back. That's strange, I think and look at him. How do you know her name? I ask. What? He blinks a couple of times. You've only said it 100 times. Oh, I say, and he spreads his hand across my thigh, squeezing gently. Well, just let me know, if you want me to call anyone, Ken offers again. After another 20 minutes or so. Karen looks back at us, excitement bursting through her expression. So how about I spy? Landon's lips turn up into a vibrant smile. Yeah, Hardin, how about I spy? Hardin leans against me, his head on my shoulder, and his arm wraps around me. I'm good. I mean, it sounds wonderful, but it's nap time for me. I'm sure Tessa and Landon would love to play. Despite his mocking the game, the public intimacy warms me and makes me smile. I remember a time when Hardin would only hold my hand under the dinner table at his father's house, and now he doesn't seem phased to be holding me in front of his family. Okay. I'll go first, Karen says. I spy with my little eye something blue, she squeals. Hardin chuckles lightly, against me. Ken's shirt, he whispers and nuzzles further into me. The navigation screen? Landon guesses. No, Ken's shirt? I ask. Yes. Tessa, it's your turn now. Hardin pinches me a little in acknowledgement, but I'm focused on Karen's massive smile. She's having way too much fun with these cheesy games, but she's too sweet for me to not to play along. Okay, I spy something. I look down at Hardin, black. Hardin's soul. Landon shouts, and I laugh. Hardin opens one eye and sticks up a middle finger at his stepbrother. You're right. I exclaim, giggling. Well then, the lot of you can shut up, so me and my black soul can get some sleep, he says, eyes closed. We ignore him and continue, and only a few minutes later Hardin's breathing turns heavy, and he begins to snore lightly into my neck. He mumbles for a moment before sliding down, putting his head on my lap, and bringing his other arm around my waist. Landon seems to take that as a cue, and lies across the middle seat, joining Hardin in sleep. Even Karen times out and ends up falling asleep. I enjoy the silence as I stare out the window, watching the lush scenery shoot past us. We're getting close, only a few more miles, Ken says to the car, to nobody in particular. I nod in acknowledgement, and run my fingers through Hardin's soft hair. His eyelids flutter lightly under my touch, but he doesn't wake up. I trail my fingers down his back, slowly, taking in the view of him sleeping so peacefully, his arms wrapped tightly around my body. Soon we turn onto a small street, the entirety of it lined with large pine trees. Silently, I watch out the window as we turn onto another street and round a corner, bringing the coast into view with sudden immediacy. It's beautiful. Glittering blue water meets the shoreline, 
creating a gorgeous contrast. The grass is brown, though, dead from a harsher than normal Washington winter. I can't imagine how beautiful this place must be in the summer. Here we are, Ken says, pulling into a long driveway. I look toward the front of the car and see a large wooden cabin. Clearly, the Scots definition of small cabin is very different from mine. The one I'm looking at is two stories tall, made entirely of dark cherry wood, and has a white trimmed porch wrapping around the ground floor. Harden, wake up. I run my index finger over his jawline. His eyes open, and he blinks rapidly, confused for a moment, then he sits up and wipes his eyes with his knuckles. Honey, we're here, Ken says to his wife, and she lifts up her head, followed by her son. Still a little dazed, Hardin carries our bags inside, where Ken shows him to the room we're staying in. I follow Karen into the kitchen, while Landon takes his bags to his room as well. The cathedral-style ceiling in the living room is repeated in the kitchen on a smaller scale. It takes me a moment to figure out what's so peculiar about this room, but then I see that the kitchen here is a smaller, yet equally elegant version of the Scots kitchen at home. This place is beautiful, I say to Karen. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you, dear. It's nice to finally have company in it. She smiles and opens the refrigerator. We love having the two of you here. I'd never have thought that Hardin would come along on a family trip. I know it's a short one, but this means the world to Ken, she says, speaking softly to ensure I'm the only one to hear. I'm glad he came along too, I think he'll enjoy himself. I say the words hoping that once they're out there in the air, they'll come true. Karen turns and grabs my hand warmly. I sure will miss you when you go to Seattle. I haven't had much time with Hardin, but I'll miss him too. I'll still be around. It's only a couple hours away, I assure her. And myself, really. I'm going to miss her and Ken. And I can't even allow my mind to wander into thoughts of Landon's looming departure. Even though I'm leaving for Seattle, before he leaves for New York, I'm not ready for him to be so far away. Being in Seattle, I'll still be in the same state at least. But New York is far, so far. I hope so. With Landon gone too, I'm afraid I'll be lost. I've been a mother for nearly 20 years she begins to tear up. I'm sorry, I'm just so proud of him. She dabs at her eyes with her fingers, stopping the tears, and looks around the kitchen, like she'll find a task that will stop this feeling she's having. Maybe the three of you can run to the store down the road while Ken gets the boat ready. Yeah, of course we can, I say as the three men enter the room. Hardin comes up behind me. I left the bags on the bed for you to unpack. I know I'd do it wrong. Thank you, I say, grateful that he didn't even try. He likes to shove things haphazardly into dresser drawers, and it drives me mad. I told Karen we'd go to the store for her, while your father gets the boat ready. Okay. He shrugs. You too. I turn to Landon, who nods. Landon knows where it is. It's just down the road. You can walk, or take the car. The keys are hanging by the door, Ken says as we head out. The weather is forgiving today, and the sun makes it feel much warmer than it should be this early in the year. The sky is a clear blue. I can hear the waves crashing, and smell the salt in the air each time the wind blows. We decide to walk down to the small store at the end of the street, and I'm comfortable in jeans. And a short-sleeved shirt. This place is so nice, it feels like we're in our own world, I say to Hardin and Landon. We are in our own world. No one bothers to come to the beach in fucking February, Hardin comments. Well, I think it's nice, I say, ignoring his attitude. Anyway, Landon looks at Hardin, who is kicking at the rocks as we walk down the gravel road. Dakota has an audition for a small production this week. Really? I say. That's so great. Yeah, she's really excited. I hope she gets the part. Didn't she just start school, though? Why would they give the part to an amateur? Hardin's voice is calm, wondering. Hardin they would give her the part, because regardless of her being an amateur or not, she's an excellent dancer, and has been studying ballet her entire life, Landon fires back. Hardin holds up his hands comically. Don't get testy, I'm just saying. But Landon defends his love. Well, don't, she's talented, 
and she's going to get the part. Hardin rolls his eyes. Okay damn. It's nice that you support her. I smile at Landon in an attempt to break up the tension brewing between him and Hardin. I'll always support her, no matter what she does. That's why I'm moving all the way to New York. Landon looks at Hardin, and Hardin's jaw tenses. So this is how this trip is going to be, then? The two of you fucking ganging up on me? Count me fucking out, then? I didn't even want to come on this shit anyway. Hardin spits. The three of us stop walking, and Landon and I both turn to Hardin. I'm thinking about how to calm him down, when Landon suddenly says, well, then you shouldn't have come. We'd all have a better time without you, and your sour attitude anyway. My eyes widen at Landon's harsh remark, and I feel the urge to defend Hardin, but I stay quiet. Besides, Landon's right, mostly. Hardin shouldn't make it his goal to ruin our trip by having an attitude for no good reason. Excuse me? You the one with a fucking attitude, because I said your girlfriend was an amateur. No, you started being a jerk in the car, Landon says. Yeah, because your mum wouldn't stop singing along to every fucking song on the radio and yelling state names, Hardin's voice rises precipitously, while I was trying to enjoy the scenery. I step between them as Hardin tries to move toward Landon. Landon takes a deep breath and stares at Hardin, challenging him. My mom is trying to make sure we all have a nice time. Well, then maybe she should, stop it, you guys. You can't fight like this the entire time we're here. No one will be able to stand it, so please just stop, I beg, not wanting to take sides between my best friend and my boyfriend. They look at each other for a few more tense moments. I nearly laugh at the way they behave like brothers despite the fact that they try so hard not to. Okay. Landon says finally, and sighs. Fine, Hardin huffs. The rest of our walk is silent, aside from Hardin's boots kicking at the rocks and Landon's soft humming. The calm after the storm or before it. Or just between them, I suppose. What are you going to wear on the boat? I ask Landon as we walk up the driveway to the cabin. Shorts, I think. It's warm right now, but I'll probably bring a sweatsuit. Oh. I wish it was warmer, so I could wear a swimsuit. I don't even own one, but the idea of shopping for one with Hardin makes me smile. I can picture him, saying crude and perverted things. He'd probably end up in the dressing room with me. I don't think I'd stop him. I need to stop thinking these types of things, especially while. Landon is talking about the weather, and I should at least appear to be listening. The boat is insane, it's so big, Landon says. Oh I cringe. Now that we're closer to the boat ride, my nerves are beginning to take over. Landon and I go into the kitchen to unpack the groceries, and Hardin heads into the bedroom without a word. Landon looks over his shoulder to where his stepbrother disappeared to. He's pretty sensitive when it comes to talking about Seattle. He still hasn't agreed to go, has he? I look around the room, to be sure no one can hear us. No, not exactly, I say and chew on my bottom lip in embarrassment. I don't get it, Landon says, looking through the bags. What's so bad about Seattle, that he won't go with you? Does he have some sort of history there? No well, not that I know of I start to say, but then Hardin's letter comes to mind. I don't remember him mentioning any hardships he'd gone through in Seattle. Could he have left them out? I don't think so. And I hope not. I'm not ready for any more surprises. Well, there has to be a reason, because he can't even go to the bathroom without you, so I can't imagine him being okay with you moving away without him. I thought he'd do anything to keep you close to him literally anything, Landon says with emphasis. Me too. I sigh, not knowing why Hardin has to be so stubborn. And he does go to the bathroom without me. Sometimes, I joke. Landon laughs along. Barely. He probably installed a hidden camera on your shirt to keep track of you. Cameras aren't my thing. I'm more of a tracking device type of guy. Hardin's voice makes me jump, and I look over to find him leaning in the doorway of the kitchen. Thanks for helping prove my point, Landon says, but Hardin chuckles, shaking his head. He seems to be in a better mood, thank goodness. Where is this boat? I'm bored listening to you two talk shit about me. We weren't, we were joking, I tell him, 
and walk over to hug him where he's standing. It's fine, I do the same when you're not around, he says in a mocking tone, although I can't help but detect a hint of seriousness behind the words. Chapter 23. Tessa. Doc's a little shaky, but sturdy enough. I need to get someone out here to remodel it Ken muses as we follow him out to the where the boat's moored. With their backyard leading directly to the water, the view is incredible. The waves crash along the rocks lining the shore, and instinctively I step behind Hardin. What's wrong? He asks quietly. Nothing. I'm just a little nervous. He turns around to face me, sliding both of his hands into the back pockets of my jeans. It's only water, baby, it'll be okay. He smiles, but I can't tell if he's mocking me or being sincere. It's only when his lips brush my cheek that my doubt disappears. I forgot you don't like water. He pulls me closer. I like water and swimming pools. And streams? His eyes glitter with humor. I smile at the memory. Only one stream in particular. I was nervous that day too. Hardin only convinced me to get into the water by bribing me. He had promised to answer one of my endless questions about him in exchange for me getting into the water with him. Those days seem so distant, so ancient, really, but the ongoing theme of secrecy still litters are present. Hardin takes my hand in his as we follow his family down the dock to the incredibly intimidating vessel waiting at the end. I don't know much about boats, but I think this one may be a giant-sized pontoon boat. I know it's not a yacht, but it's bigger than any fishing boat I've ever seen. It's so big, I whisper to Hardin. SHH, don't talk about my dick in front of my family, he teases. I love this playful, yet grumpy mood he's in. His smile is contagious. Then the dock creaks beneath my feet, and I squeeze tight against Hardin in panic. Watch the step, Ken calls back to us as he climbs onto the ladder connecting the boat in the dock. Hardin's hand moves to my back as he helps me up the ladder. I try to force myself to imagine that it's just a small ladder at a playground, not something attached to an enormous boat. The reassurance that comes with Hardin's touch is the only thing keeping me from running back up the shaky dock, into the cabin, and hiding under the bed. Ken helps us each onto the deck, and once there, I can see how nice the boat is, decorated in white wood and caramel leather. The seating area is large, big enough for all of us, and then some to sit comfortably. When he tries to help Hardin aboard, his son waves him off. When he's fully on the deck, he looks around and says plainly, it's nice to see that your boat is nicer than mum's house. Ken's proud smile fades. Hardin, I whisper, tugging at his hand. Sorry, he huffs. Ken sighs but seems to accept his son's apology before walking over to the other side of the boat. You okay? Hardin leans into me. Yeah, just be nice please. I'm already nauseous. I'll be nice. I already apologized. He takes a seat on one of the lounges, and I join him. Landon takes the grocery bag and leans down to unpack cans of soda and bags of snacks. I gaze across the expanse of the boat and out onto the water. It's beautiful, and the sun is dancing across the surface. I love you, Hardin says softly into my ear. The boat's engine comes to life with a light hum, and I scoot closer to Hardin. I love you, I say back, still looking out onto the water. If we get out far enough we may see a few dolphins, or if we're lucky, a whale. Ken says loudly. A whale would surely knock this boat over in no time flat, Hardin remarks, and I gulp at the thought. Shit, sorry, he apologizes. The farther and farther we get from the shore, the calmer I become. It's odd, I thought it would be the opposite, but there's a certain serenity that comes with being so disconnected from the land. Do you see dolphins a lot out here? I ask Karen as she sips on her soda. She smiles. No, only once. But we still try. I can't believe the weather today, it feels like June, Landon remarks, pulling his t-shirt over his head. Are you working on your tan? I ask him, taking in his pale torso. Or your ghost impression? Hardin adds. Landon rolls his eyes, but otherwise ignores the remark. Yep, even though I won't need a tan in the city. If the water wasn't ice cold, we could all go for a swim closer to shore, Karen says. Maybe in the summer, I remind her, 
and she nods happily. At least we still have the jacuzzi back at the cabin, Ken says. Enjoying the moment, I look up at Hardin, but he stays quiet, staring off into the distance. Look. There. Ken points behind us. Hardin and I both turn quickly, and it takes me a moment to see what he's spotted. It's a pod of dolphins leaping through the water. They aren't close to the boat, but they're close enough that we can see the way they move and sink through the waves. It's our lucky day. Karen laughs. The wind blows my hair across my face, blocking my view for a moment, and Hardin's hand reaches up to tuck it back behind my ear. It's always the simple things he does, the small ways he finds to touch me without thought that make my stomach flutter. That was so neat, I say to him once the dolphins have fully passed by. Yeah, it was, actually, he says, sounding surprised. After two hours of conversation about boating, the beautiful summers along this spot of coastline, sports, and an awkward mention of Seattle, that Hardin halted, almost as soon as it began, Ken leads us back to the shore. That wasn't so bad, was it? Hardin and I ask each other at the same time. Guess not. He laughs, helping me down the ladder to the dock. The sun has marked his cheeks, and the bridge of his nose, and his hair is unruly, and blown out from the wind. He's so lovely, it hurts. We all walk across the backyard, and all I can think about is how much I want to hold on to that peaceful sensation of being out on the water. As we enter the cabin, Karen announces, I'll make us all lunch, I'm sure everyone is hungry, and disappears into the kitchen. The rest of us stand there silent and content as she walks off. Finally, Hardin asks his father, what else is there to do here? Well, there's a nice restaurant further in town, we were planning for all of us to have dinner there tomorrow. There's an old-fashioned movie theater, a library, so, a bunch of lame shit, then? Hardin says, his words harsh, but his tone playful. It's a nice place, you should give it a chance, Ken says, not in the least bit offended. The four of us head into the kitchen and stand around while Karen puts together a platter of sandwiches and fruit. Hardin, who is being overly affectionate today, rests his hand on my hip. Maybe this place is good for him. After lunch, I help Karen clean the kitchen and make lemonade, while Landon and Hardin discuss how terrible modern literature is. I can't help but laugh when Landon mentions Harry Potter. This sends Hardin into a five-minute-long speech on why he never has read and never will read the books, and Landon tries desperately to get him to change his mind. After the lemonade is finished and greedily drunk down, Ken says to us all, Karen and I are going to head down to our friend's cabin a few doors down for an hour or two, if you all want to come. Hardin looks over at me from across the room, and I wait for him to answer. I'll pass, he finally says still looking at me. Landon looks back and forth between Hardin and me. I'll come, he says plainly, but I swear I catch him smirk at Hardin before he stands up to join Ken and his mom. Chapter 24. Hardin. I am thinking they will never leave, but as soon as they do, I pull her over to the couch with me. You didn't want to go, she asks. Fuck, no, why the hell would I want to go? I'd much rather stay here with you. Alone. I say and brush the hair back from her neck. She squirms a little from the light shiver my touch spreads across her skin. Did you want to go sit and listen to a roomful of boring ass people talk about boring ass shit? I ask her, my lips barely grazing her jaw. No. Her breathing has already changed. You're sure? I tease and run my nose along her neck, nudging her to tilt her head. I don't know, it may have been more fun than this, she says. I chuckle into her neck, kissing her where the goosebumps on her skin appear from my breath. Not fucking likely. We do have a hot tub in our room, remember? Yeah, but it's no good, because I don't have a swimsuit she starts. I suck lightly at her neck, and imagine what she'd look like in a bathing suit. Fuck. You don't need one, I whisper. She moves her head back and looks at me like I'm crazy. Yes, I do. I'm not getting in a hot tub with no clothes on. Why not? It sounds like a pretty fun time to me. Because your family is here. I don't know why you always use that as an excuse my hand travels down to her lap and I press against the seam of her jeans. 
Sometimes I think you may like that. Like what, she asks, practically fucking panting. The possibility of being caught. Why would anyone like that? A lot of people do, the thrill of being caught, you know? I apply more pressure between her legs, and she tries to clamp them shut, struggling against what she wants, and what she thinks she shouldn't want. No, that's I don't know, but I don't like it, she lies. I'm pretty damn sure she does. Mm hmm I don't, she cries, defending herself, her cheeks flushed and eyes wide in embarrassment. Tess, it's okay that you do. It's pretty fucking hot, really, I assure her. I don't. Sure, Tessa. Okay, you don't. I raise my hands in defeat, and she whimpers a little from the loss of contact. I knew there was no way in hell she'd admit it, but hey, it was worth a try. Are you going to come into the jacuzzi with me? I ask and remove my hand from her. I'll come up there, but I'm not getting in. Suit yourself. I smile and stand up. I know she'll end up in there. She'll just need more persuading than most girls. Come to think of it, I've never actually been in a jacuzzi with a female before, naked or not. Wrapping her small hand around my wrist, she follows me upstairs to the room that is considered ours for the next few days. The balcony connected to it is what made me claim it in the first place. The moment I saw the jacuzzi sitting there, I had to get her into it. The bed isn't bad either. It's small, but we don't need a big bed with the way we sleep any damn way. I really do love it here. It's so peaceful, she says and sits on the bed to take her shoes off. I open the double doors to the balcony. It's okay. If my father, his wife, and Landon weren't here, it would sure as hell be better. I don't have anything to wear tomorrow to that restaurant your father was talking about. I shrug and lean down to turn the faucet on the jacuzzi. We won't go, then. I want to go. I just didn't know we were going out somewhere before I packed. It's poor planning on their fault, then, I say and study the gauges to make sure they look like they're working. We'll just wear jeans. Seems like a casual area. I don't know. Well, if you don't want to wear jeans, we can find a store in this dump to get you something else, I offer, and she smiles. Why are you in such a good mood? Tessa raises an eyebrow at me. I dip a finger into the water. Almost there. This thing heats up quickly. I don't know I just am. Okay should I be worried? She asks, stepping out to join me on the balcony. No. Yes. I gesture to the wicker chair next to the hot tub. Will you at least sit out here with me while I enjoy the relaxation that is sitting in scalding hot water? She laughs and nods taking a seat. I watch her innocent eyes as she stares at me, while I pull my shirt over my head and take my pants off. I leave my boxers on. I want her to take them off. You sure you don't want to come in? I ask her, and lift my leg over the edge and climb in. Fuck, it's hot as hell. A few. Seconds later the burn disappears, and I lean back against the hard plastic. I'm sure, she says and looks out at the woods surrounding us. No one can see us. Do you really think I'd ask you to come in here naked if someone could? I ask. I mean, me with my jealousy issues in Watnet. What if they come back, she asks quietly, as if someone can hear her. They said an hour or two. Yeah, but I thought you were learning to live a little. I tease my beautiful girl. I am. You're sitting there patting in a chair, while I'm enjoying the view, I point out. I'm not patting, she says and pouts more. I smirk at her, knowing it will irritate her further. Okay, I say, closing my eyes as she purses her lips. I sure am lonely in here. I may have to take care of myself. I don't have anything to wear. Deja vu, I remark, thinking about our experience at the stream for the second time today. I, just get in the damn water, I say, without opening my eyes or changing my tone. I speak to her like it's inevitable because we both know it is. Fine, I am, she says, trying to convince herself she's exasperated, and doesn't really want this as much as she does. That wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. When I open my eyes, I nearly choke. She's lifting her shirt over her head, and of course she's wearing that damn red bra. Take the bra off, I say. She looks around again, and I shake my head. The only thing she can see from this balcony is the water and trees. 
take it off, baby, I coax, and she nods, sliding the straps down her arms. I'll never get enough of her. No matter how many times I touch her, fuck her, kiss her, hold her it will never be enough, I'll always want more. It's not even about the sex, which we have often, it's that I'm the only one who's ever been with her, and she trusts me enough to get naked on a fucking balcony. So why then am I such a fuck up? I don't want to fuck this up with this girl. Her jeans join her t-shirt and bra on the chair, folded perfectly, of course. Panties too, I remind her. No, yours are on, she fires back and steps into the water. Ouch, she squeaks, pulling her foot back before easing in. Once she's all the way in, she sighs, her body having gotten used to the water. Come here. I reach for her and pull her onto my lap. I suppose the uncomfortable plastic seats can be useful after all. The way her body feels against me, in combination with the pulsing jets, makes me want to rip those panties right off. It could be like this in Seattle, all the time, she says, and her arms wrap around my neck. Like what? The last thing I want to do is talk about fucking Seattle. If I could find a way to wipe that damn city off the map, I would. Like this. She gestures between us. Just us, no problems with your friends, like Molly, no bad history. Just you and me in a new city. We could start all over, harden, together. It's not that simple, I tell her. Yes, it is, no more said. I thought you were going to come in here and fuck me, not talk about said, I tease, and she tenses. Sorry, I calm down, I'm joking. Well, about the said thing. I shift her body on mine, so she's straddling my lap, her bare chest flush against mine. You're everything to me, you know that, don't you? I repeat the question I've had to ask her so many times. She doesn't answer this time. Instead she rests her elbows on my shoulders, threads her fingers through my hair, and kisses. Me. She's hungry. Just like I knew she'd be. Chapter 25. Harden. I attempt to pull her nearly naked body even closer to me as she deepens the kiss. Her hands grip my arms, and I guide my hand down between her thighs. No point in wasting any time here. Should have taken these off, I tell her, tugging at the side of her thin, soaked panties. She lets out a breathless laugh, before sucking in a sharp breath, when my fingers enter her. Her moans are cut off by my mouth against hers. She pulls my bottom lip between hers, and I nearly lose it. She's so fucking sexy and seductive, and she doesn't even fucking try. When she begins to rock her hips, pushing herself onto my hand, I grip her waist, move her from my lap, and place her next to me, her legs spread wide, my fingers still pleasing her. These fucking panties are getting on my nerves. She startles, then pouts when I remove my fingers from her and hook them around her panties, tugging them down as quickly as possible and leaving her to kick them off the end of one foot into the water beside her. I watch for a second as the jets carry them to the other side of the tub, there's something mesmerizing about seeing that final barrier float away so smoothly. But quickly, Tessa grabs my wrist to force me to touch her again. What do you want? I urge, wanting to hear the words from her. You. She smiles sweetly, then spreads her legs further, showing how dirty she really is. Turn around, then, I tell her. Without giving her a chance to respond, I turn her body around, and she lets out a yelp. I panic for a moment, but then realize that her little pussy is directly lined up with the jets. Of course, she's moaning. She'll be fucking screaming in a minute. I kneel behind her, I love taking her this way. I can feel so much more of her, I can touch the creamy skin on her back and pay attention to every muscle moving under her skin, and I watch every breath she fights for as I rock into her. I move her long hair to the side and move closer, slowly pushing farther into her. Her back arches into me, and I take her breasts in my hands as I begin to move in and out of her slowly. Fuck, it feels so damn good, better than ever. It has to be the hot water pushing around us as I inch in and out of her. She moans, and I reach down to make sure she's still being hit with the rushing water. Her eyes are screwed shut, and her mouth is wide open. Her knuckles are nearly white from gripping the edge of the tub. I want to move faster, to pound into her, 
but I force myself to stay at this low, torturing pace. Hard in, she moans. Fuck, it's like I can finally feel every inch of you. The moment I say the words, I panic and pull away from her. A condom. I didn't even think to use a fucking condom. What has she done to me? What's wrong, she pants, a thin layer of moisture covering her face. I don't have a condom on. I run my hands over my wet hair. Oh, she says calmly. Oh? What do you mean, oh? So put a condom on, she suggests with a doe-eyed look. That's not the point. I stand up in the tub. She doesn't say anything. If I hadn't thought about it, you could have gotten pregnant. She nods understandingly. Okay, yeah, but you did remember. Why is she so calm about this? She has this grand plan to move to Seattle. A baby would definitely fuck that up. Wait. Is that your plan or something? If I get you pregnant, you think I'll go with you? I sound like a fucking conspiracy theorist, but it does make sense. She turns around, laughing. You aren't serious. And when she tries to wrap her arms around me, I move out of the way. I am. Come on, that's insane. Come here, babe. She tries to grab me again, but I dodge her, moving to the opposite side of the jacuzzi. Hurt flashes as clear as a goddamn neon sign across her face, and she covers her boobs with her hands. You're the one who forgot about a condom, and now you're saying that I'm trying to trap you by getting pregnant? She shakes her head in disbelief. Just listen to yourself. Well, it wouldn't be the first time some crazy chick did that. I slide over to get a little closer now, but she quickly rises onto her knees on the bench. I give her an impassive look, saying nothing. Watching me, her eyes brim with tears as she stands up in the water and climbs out of the tub. I'm going to take a shower. She disappears into the bedroom, slamming first the door to the deck and then the bathroom as she goes. Fuck. I yell, smacking a palm at the bubbling water, wishing it could hit me back. I do need to listen to what I'm saying, this isn't some random crazy bitch. This is Tessa. What the hell is wrong with me? I'm so fucking paranoid. My guilt over the Seattle shit is causing me to lose my fucking mind. What's left of it, anyway? I have to fix this, or at least try to. I owe it to her, especially after I just accused her of the dumbest shit possible. Ironically, in a twisted way, I almost wish I hadn't remembered the condom myself, no. No, I don't. I just don't want her to leave me, and I don't know what else to do to get her to stay. A baby isn't the answer that's for damn sure. I've done everything I possibly can except lock her in the apartment. Sure, it's an idea that's actually crossed my mind a few times, but I don't think she would like it too much. Plus she'd probably get a vitamin D deficiency. And stop going to yoga, and so stop wearing those pants. I need to go inside and apologize for embarrassing her and being a dick to her before the entire gang returns. Maybe I'll get lucky and they'll get lost in the woods for a few hours. But first, I have something else I need to do. I climb out of the hot tub and walk into the room. It's cold as hell now that I'm only wearing soaked boxers. I glance back and forth between my phone and the bathroom door connected to our room. The shower's still running, so I grab my phone and a blanket from the back of the chair before stepping back out onto the balcony. I scroll through my contacts and find the name Samuel, Real fucking clever decoy, there. I don't know why I saved this woman's number anyway, I guess I knew somehow I'd get tangled in a fucking web and have to call the bitch back. I changed the name in case Tessa went snooping through my shit, which I knew she would do. I thought she'd caught me when she asked about my deleted history and heard me yelling at Molly on the phone. In some ways, I'm sure she'd rather see Molly on my call log than this person. Chapter 26. Tessa. I can't believe Hardin had the nerve to accuse me of trying to get myself pregnant or even thinking that there's even a small chance that I would do something like that to him or to myself. The whole thing's just absurd and stupid all around. Everything was going so great, incredible, really, until he mentioned the condom. He should have just gotten out of the water and grabbed one. I know he has a pile of them in the top of his suitcase. I watched him shove them in there after I neatly packed our bags. He's probably just frustrated over this whole Seattle mess, 
so he overreacted, and maybe I did too. As a result of my annoyance with Hardin's rude comments and his ruining our moment in the hot tub, I need a hot shower. Seconds later the water begins to work against my strained muscles, relaxing my nerves and clearing my head. We both overreacted, him more than me, and the argument was so unnecessary. I reach for the shampoo. And then realize I was so rattled, while getting away from him, that I forgot to grab my toiletry bag. Great. Harden? I call. I doubt he can hear me over the shower and hot tub, but I pull the floral shower curtain back and watch for him just in case. When he doesn't appear in the doorway after a few seconds, I grab my towel and wrap it around my body. Trailing water into the bedroom, I reach the suitcases lying on the bed when I hear Hardin's voice. I can't quite hear what he's saying, but I catch his tone of false niceness, which tells me he's trying to be polite and not show his frustration. Which tells me that this conversation is something he deems important enough to not act like himself. I pad quietly across the wooden floor, and since he's on speaker, I hear someone say, because I'm a realtor, and my job is to fill empty apartments. Hardin sighs. Well, do you have any more empty apartments to fill? He asks. Wait, Hardin's trying to get me an apartment? I'm as shocked as I am excited at the thought. He's finally coming around to the idea of Seattle, and he's actually trying to help me instead of push against me. For once. The woman on the other end, who, I realize, has a very familiar voice, replies, you gave me the impression that your friend Tessa was not someone I should be wasting my time giving an apartment to. What? Wait is that he wouldn't. Here's the thing she isn't as bad as I made her out to be. She hasn't actually trashed any apartments or left without paying, he says, and my stomach turns. He did. I burst through the doors to the deck. You sick, selfish bastard. I scream, the first words that come to mind. Hardin spins to me, face paling, mouth opening wide. His phone tumbles to the floor, and he just stares at me like I'm some terrible creature who's come to destroy him. Hello? Sandra's voice says through the speaker, and he reaches down to grab his phone to silence her. Anger courses through me. How could you? How could you do that? I, he begins. No. Don't even waste my time with an excuse. What the hell were you thinking? I yell with one arm sweeping in his direction violently. I storm back into the bedroom, and he follows me, pleading, Tessa, listen to me. I turn around, feeling wounded and strong, and hurt, and enraged. No. You listen to me, Hardin, I say through my teeth, trying to lower my voice. But I can't. I'm so sick of this, I'm sick of you trying to sabotage everything in my life that doesn't revolve around you. I scream, bowling my fists tightly at my sides. That's not what I, shut up. Shut the hell up. You are the most selfish, arrogant, you're just ug. I can't think straight. Angry words fly from my mouth, my hands moving through the air in front of me. I don't know what I was thinking. I was trying to clear it up just now. I shouldn't be so surprised, really. I should have known that Hardin was behind Sandra's sudden disappearance. He doesn't know when to stop meddling in my life, my career, and I'm sick of it. Exactly. This is exactly what I'm talking about. You're always doing something. You're always hiding something. You're always finding new ways to try to control every single thing I do, and I can't take it anymore. This is too much. I can't help but pace back and forth across the room, and Hardin watches me with cautious eyes. I can handle you being a little overprotective, and I can handle you getting in a fight now and then. Hell, I can even handle you being a complete asshole half the time, because deep down I always knew you were doing what you thought was best for me. But not this. You're trying to ruin my future, and I won't fucking have it. I'm sorry, he says. And I know that he means it, but, you're always fucking sorry. It's always the same shit, you do something, hide something, say something, I cry, you say you're sorry, and bam. All is forgiven. I point a harsh finger at him. But not this time. I have the urge to slap hard and right across his face but I look around for something to take my anger out on instead. I grab a frilly pillow from the bed and throw it onto the floor. 
Then I'd throw a second one. It doesn't do much for the anger flaming inside me, but I'd feel even worse if I destroyed anything of Karen's. This is so exhausting. I don't know how much more I can take before I break. Fuck that, I won't break. I'm sick of breaking, that's all I ever do. I need to pick up my own pieces, put them back together neatly, and hide them away from Hardin, to keep them from ending up in a pile at his feet again. I'm sick of the endless cycle. I've told you before, and you don't listen. You find new ways to continue the cycle, and I'm done. I'm so fucking done. I don't know if I've ever been this angry at him. Yes, he's done worse things, but I've always moved on from that. We were never in a place like this before, a place where I thought he was done hiding things from me, and I thought he understood that he can't mess with my career. This chance means everything to me. I've spent my life watching what happens to a woman who has nothing of her own. My mother never had anything that she herself earned, anything that was hers, and I need that. I need to do this. I need this chance to prove that even though I'm young, I can make a life for myself that my mother never could make for herself. I can't let anyone take this from me, the way my mother let it slip from her. Done with me? His voice is shaky, and it cracks. You said you're done I don't know what I'm done with. It should be him, but I know myself better than to answer that right now. Normally I would be crying by this point, and forgiving him with a kiss but not tonight. I'm so fucking exhausted, and I can't stand it. I can't keep doing this like this. You were going to let me move to Seattle without anywhere to live, just to try to force me not to go. Hardin stands before me in silence, and I take a deep breath, expecting my anger to diminish, but it doesn't. It grows and grows until I am literally seeing red. I grab the rest of the pillows, imagining that they're actually glass vases that shatter to the floor, leaving a mess for someone else to clean up. The problem is that I would be the one doing the cleaning, he wouldn't take the chance of cutting himself in order to spare me. Get out. I scream at him. No, I'm sorry, okay, I, get the fuck out. Now, I spit, and he looks at me like he has no idea who I am. Maybe he hasn't. He hunches over and leaves the room, and I slam the door behind him before going back out to the balcony. I sit down on the wicker chair and stare out at the sea, trying to calm myself down. No tears come, only memories. Memories and regrets. Chapter 27. Harden. I know she's exhausted, I can see it on her face each time I fuck up. The fight with said, the lie about the expulsion every infraction takes a toll on her. She thinks I don't notice, but I do. Why did I have to put Sandra on speakerphone? If I hadn't done that, I could have cleaned this shit up and told her about my fuck up after I fixed it. That way she couldn't be as upset. I wasn't thinking about what Tessa would do when she found out, and I sure as hell wasn't thinking about where she'd live if she didn't change her mind about moving. I suppose I thought that being the control freak that she is, she'd postpone her trip if she didn't have anywhere to stay. Way to fucking go, Harden. I meant well, well, I didn't at the time, but now I do. I know it's fucked up for me to mess with her apartment in Seattle but I'm grasping at straws here, trying to get her not to leave me. I know what will happen in Seattle, and it's not going to end well. True to my nature, I take a swing at the wall next to the staircase. Fuck. True to my luck, I find out it's not drywall. It's real fucking wood, and hurts so much worse. I cradle my fist with my other hand, and have to stop myself from repeating my idiotic reaction. I'm lucky it didn't break anything. Sure it will bruise, but what else is new? I'm sick of the endless cycle. I've told you before, and you don't listen. I stomp down the stairs, and throw myself on the couch like a temperamental child. That's what I'm really, a fucking child. She knows it, I know it, hell, everyone fucking knows it. I should just print the shit on a goddamn t-shirt. I should just go up there, and try to explain myself again, but honestly, I'm a little scared. I've never seen her so mad before. I need to get the hell out of here. If Tessa hadn't forced me to ride with the entire fucking Partridge family, I could leave now and end this stupid ass trip early. I didn't even want to come in the first place. I guess the boat was sort of okay, but the trip in general is bullshit 
And now that she's mad at me, there's literally no point in me being here. I stare up at the ceiling, unsure what I'm supposed to do now. I can't just sit here, and I know if I do, I'll end up back upstairs pushing Tessa further. I'll take a walk. That's what normal people do when they're angry, not punch walls and break shit. I need to get some damn clothes on before I do anything, but I can't go back up there, or she'll murder me, literally. I sigh as I get up. If I wasn't so confused by Tessa's behavior, I'd care more about what I'm about to do. The door to Landon's room opens, and my eyes roll immediately. His clothes are stacked neatly on the bed. He must have been planning to dutifully put them away before his mom, and my dad dragged him along with them. I sift through the hideous crap and desperately search for something that doesn't have a fucking collar. Finally, I find a plain blue t-shirt and a pair of black sweet pants. Fucking lovely. I've now resorted to sharing clothes with Landon. I hope Tessa's rage doesn't last long, but for once I don't know what will happen next. I hadn't expected her to react half as bad as she did. It wasn't really the words she used toward me, it was the way she looked at me the whole time. That look said more than she ever could, and, in turn, scared me more than her words alone ever could. I glance at the door to what was her room up until 20 minutes ago, then head back down the stairs and out the door. I barely make it down the damn driveway before my favorite stepbrother appears. At least he's alone. Where's my dad? I ask him. Are you wearing my clothes? He responds, clearly confused. Um, yeah. I didn't have a choice, don't make a big deal of it. I shrug, knowing by the smile on his face he was planning on doing just that. Okay what did you do now? What the hell? What makes you think I did something? His brow arches. Okay so I did something, something really fucking stupid, I huff. But I don't want to hear your shit so don't worry about it. Fine. He shrugs and begins to walk away from me. I was hoping for a few words from him, he's okay with advice sometimes. Wait. I call and he turns around. You're not going to ask me what it was? You just said you don't want to talk about it, he replies. Yeah, but I will. I don't know what to say, and he's looking at me like I've grown two heads. Do you want me to ask you? He looks pleased but thankfully he's not being too much of an asshole about it. I'm the reason I begin, but just then I see Karen, and my dad starting to walk up the driveway. The reason what? Landon asks, looking back at them. Nothing, never mind. I sigh, running my fingers through my damp hair in frustration. Hey Harden. Where's Tessa? Karen asks. Why does everyone always ask me that, as if I can't be more than five feet away from her? The building ache in my chest reminds me of just that, I can't. She's inside, sleeping, I lie and turn to Landon. I'm going for a walk, can you make sure she's okay? He nods. Where are you going? My father's voice calls as I walk past them. Out, I snap and walk faster. By the time I reach a stop sign a few roads over, I realize I have no fucking idea where I'm going, or even how to get back to where I came from. I just know I've been walking for a while, and that all of these roads are deceptively windy. I officially hate this place. It didn't seem so bad while I was watching Tessa's hair blow lightly in the wind, her eyes focused on the shining water, her lips turned up in a small, satisfied smile. She looked so relaxed, like the calm waves far from the shore, steady and undisturbed until our boat intruded on their peace. Now behind us, the water roars, whipping up onto the sides of our boat in an angry way. Soon they'll go back to their resting state, until another boat comes along to disturb their ease. A girl's voice interrupts the image of Tessa's sun-kissed skin. Are you lost or something? When I turn around, I'm surprised to find a girl, around my age, I think. Her brown hair is as long as Tessa's. She's alone out here at night. I look around us. There's nothing, only an empty gravel road and forest. Are you? I reply, taking notice of her long skirt. She smiles at me and walks closer. She must be lacking brain cells to be out here in the middle of nowhere, asking a complete stranger that looks like me if he's lost. No. I'm escaping she says, tucking her hair behind her ear. You're running away? At, like, age 20? 
She better keep her ass moving down the street, then. The last thing I need is a mangry father looking for his overdressed teenage daughter. No. She laughs. I'm home from college visiting my parents, and they were boring me to death. Oh, good for you. I hope your freedom trail finds you at Shangri-La I reply and begin to walk away from her. You're going the wrong way she calls out. Don't care I say. And then I groan when I hear her footsteps crunching against the gravel behind me. Chapter 28. Tessa. I'm so exhausted, just plain tired of dealing with fight after fight with Harden. I'm not sure what to do now, where to go from here. I've been following him down the path we've been on for months now, and I'm not sure we're actually going anywhere. We're both just as lost as we were at the start. Tessa? Landon's voice carries through the room and out to the balcony. Out here, I reply, thankful that I put on a pair of shorts and a sweatshirt. Hardin always teases me when I do that, but it's comfortable at times like this, not too hot, but not too cold. Hey, he says, coming out and sitting in the chair next to mine. Hey. I glance over at him, before staring back at the water. Are you okay? I take a moment, to think over his question, am I okay? No. Will I be? Yes. Yeah, this time I think I am. I bring my knees to my chest, and wrap my arms around them. Do you want to talk about it? No. I don't want to ruin the trip with all my drama. I'm fine, really. Okay, just know if you want to talk, I'll listen. I know. I look over at him, and he gives me a reassuring smile. I don't know what I'm going to do without him. His eyes go wide, and he points over at something. Are those I look over to where he's staring? Oh God. I jump from my seat and grab the red panties that are floating in the hot tub and shove them into the front pocket of my sweatshirt. Landon bites down on his bottom lip to stifle his laugh, but I can't keep mine in. We both burst into laughter, his genuine, mine out of humiliation. But I'll take this laughter with Landon over my usual post-fight crying with Hardin any day. Chapter 29. Hardin. I'm growing more and more sick of seeing nothing but gravel and trees, while roaming around this small town. The strange girl is still following behind me, and my fight with Tess is still weighing down on me. Are you going to follow me around this entire town? I ask the pestering girl. No, I'm going back to my parents' cabin. Well, go to their cabin alone. You weren't very polite, she hums. Really? I roll my eyes, even though she can't see my face. I've been told civility is one of my strongest attributes. Someone lied to you, she says and giggles behind me. I kick at a rock, for once glad for Tessa's cleanliness, since if she hadn't made me take my shoes off at the door of the cabin, I'd be stuck wearing Landon sneakers. Not a good look. Plus, I'm almost certain his feet are much smaller than mine. So where are you from, she asks. I ignore her, and continue on my trek. I think I'm supposed to turn left at the next stop sign. I sure as hell hope so. England? Yup, I say. Then figure I might as well ask. Which way? I turn and see her point to the right. Of course, I was wrong. Her eyes are an icy blue, and her skirt drags across the gravel below her feet. She reminds me of Tessa well, the Tessa I was first introduced to. My Tessa no longer wears hideous things like that. She has also learned a new vocabulary. All credit for that goes to me for making her cuss my ass out on a wide range of occasions. Are you here with your parents too? Her voice is low, sweet even. No well, sort of. They are sort of your parents? She smiles. Her use of they are instead of the contraction there reminds me of Tess too. I look over to the girl again to make sure she's actually there. And this isn't some freaky Christmas carol type shit where she's an apparition that has come to teach me some sort of lesson. They're my family, and my girlfriend. I have a girlfriend, by the way, I warn her. I don't see this girl being interested in someone like me, but then again I once thought the same about Tessa. Okay she says, okay. I pick up my pace, wanting to create some space between us. I turn right, and she does too. Both of us move onto the grass as a truck passes us by, and she catches up again. Where is she, then? Your girlfriend, she asks. Sleeping. 
It makes sense to use the same lie I told my father and Karen. <laughs> what? I look at her. Nothing. She stares forward. You've already followed me halfway back. If you have something to say, then say it, I say irritably. She twists something in her hands, looking down. I was just thinking that you seem like you're trying to escape from something or hide I don't know, never mind. I'm not hiding. She told me to get the fuck out, so I did. What the hell does this one of Tessa know anyway? She looks up at me. Why did she kick you out? Are you always this nosy? She smiles. Yeah, I am, she says with a nod. I hate nosy people. Except Tessa, of course. No matter how much I love her, sometimes I want to tape her mouth shut following one of her interrogations. She's literally the most intrusive human being I've ever met. I'm lying, really. I love her pestering behavior. I used to hate it, but I get it now. I want to know all about her, to what she's thinking, what she's doing, what she wants. I realize, to my fucking horror, that I ask more questions now than she does. So, are you going to tell me, the girl presses. What's your name? I ask her, avoiding her question. Lillian, she says and drops, whatever was in her hand. I'm Hardin. She tucks her hair behind her ear. Tell me about your girlfriend. Why? It seems like you're upset, and who better to talk to than a stranger? I don't want to talk to her. She's eerily similar to Tessa, and it's making me uneasy. I don't think it's a good idea. The sun has disappeared early here, and the sky is nearly black. And keeping it in is, she asks sensibly. Too sensibly. Look, you seem nice and all, but I don't know you and you don't know me, so this conversation isn't going to happen. She frowns. Then sighs. Fine. Finally, I can see the familiar sloped roof of my father's cabin in the distance. Well, this is me, I say by way of dismissing myself. Really? Wait your dad is Ken, isn't he? She slaps her small hand against her forehead. Yeah? I say, surprised. We both stop walking at the end of the driveway. I'm an idiot, of course. With the accents, how did I not think of it earlier? She laughs. I don't get it. I look down at her. Your dad and my dad are friends, they went to college together or something. I just spent the last hour listening to them tell stories of their glory days. Oh, that's ironic. I half smile. I don't feel as uncomfortable around the girl as I did a few minutes ago. She smiles brightly. So really we aren't strangers after all. Chapter 30. Tessa. Cookies. Landon and I answer in unison. Cookies it is, then. Karen smiles and opens the cabinet. Karen never stops, she's always baking, roasting, toasting. Not that I'm complaining, her cooking is incredible. It's dark out now. I hope he doesn't get lost out there, Ken says. Landon just shrugs like that's Hardin. Hardin has been gone for nearly three hours, and I'm trying my best not to panic. I know he's okay. If something were to ever happen to him, I would know. I don't know how to explain it, but I know deep down that I would just know. So something harming him is not what I'm worried about. I'm worried that his frustration will just become an excuse to find some local bar. As much as I wanted him to get away from me, it would kill me to see him stumble through the door and smell liquor on his breath. I just needed my space, time to think and cool down. I haven't gotten around to the thinking part. I've been avoiding it at all costs. I was thinking we could all get in the jacuzzi tonight or maybe in the morning. Karen suggests. Landon spits his soda back into his cup, and I look away quickly, biting the inside of my cheek. The memory of Landon spotting my floating panties is much too fresh, and I can feel the heat in my cheeks. Karen, honey, I don't think they want to get in the jacuzzi with us. Ken laughs and Karen smiles, realizing that it would be a little awkward maybe. I guess you're right. She laughs and starts separating the cookie dough into small balls. She scrunches her nose. I hate this pre-made stuff. I'm sure that for Karen, pre-made cookie dough is awful, but for me, it's heaven. Especially now, when I feel like I could snap at any moment. Landon and I were in the middle of a discussion about Dakota and their soon, to be apartment when his mother and Ken finally checked in on us. 
They mentioned that they ran into Hardin as he was leaving. Apparently he told them that I was asleep, so I did my best to go along with his lie, saying that I had only woken up when Landon came in. I've been wondering where Hardin is and when he will return since the moment he left. Part of me doesn't want to see him at all, but part of me, a much bigger part, needs to know that he isn't doing anything that will further jeopardize our already fragile relationship. I'm still extremely angry it is interfering with my move to Seattle, and I have no idea what the hell I'm going to do about it. Chapter 31. Hardin. You sabotaged her getting an apartment? Lillian asks, her jaw falling open. I told you it was fucked up, I remind her. Another pair of headlights flashes by us as we walk to her parents' cabin. I had every intention of going back to my father's, but Lillian has proven herself to be a decent listener so far. So when she asked me to walk her back to her cabin and finish our discussion, I accepted. My absence will give Tessa some time to cool down and hopefully be ready to talk by the time I return. You didn't tell me what level of messed up it was. I don't blame her for being mad at you, the girl says, of course ready to take Tessa's side. I can't imagine what she'd think of me if she knew about all the shit I've put Tessa through in the past six months. Well, what are you going to do about it, she asks, opening the front door to her parents' cabin. She gestures for me to come in, like it was a foregone conclusion that I would. Once I step inside, I see it's very extravagant. Even bigger than my father's. Fucking rich people. They should be upstairs, she says as we walk inside. Who should be upstairs, a woman's voice questions, and Lillian grimaces, before turning around to the woman I assume is her mum. She looks just like her, the only difference between them being age. Who's this, she asks. Just then, a middle-aged man wearing a polo shirt and khakis walks into the living room. Great. Fucking great. I should have just stuck to walking Lillian home. I wonder how Tessa would feel if she knew I was here. Would she mind? She's pretty mad at me anyway, and she has a history of being jealous of Molly. Still, this girl isn't Molly. She's nothing like her. Mom, Dad, this is Hardin, Ken's son. A huge grin appears on the man's face. I was wondering if I'd get to meet you, he exclaims with a posh British accent. Well, that explains how he would know my father from university. He walks over and pats my shoulder. I take a step back, causing him to frown slightly, although he also kind of seems to have expected this reaction from me. My father must have warned him about me. I almost laugh at the thought. Honey, he says, turning to his wife. This is Trisha's son. You know my mom? I ask him before also turning to his wife. Yeah, I knew your mom back before she was your mom, the woman says with a smile. We were all friends, the five of us, she adds. Five? I ask. Lillian's dad looks at her. Now, honey. Anyway, you look just like her. Only you have your father's eyes. I haven't seen her since I moved back to America. How is she? She asks. She's good. She's getting married soon. Really? She squeals. Tell her congratulations from me. That is just so great to hear. Okay, I respond. These people smile too damn much. It's like being in a room with three Karens, only much more annoying and much less charming. Well, I'm going to get going, I tell Lillian, figuring this has been awkward enough. No, no. You don't have to go. We'll go upstairs, Lillian's father says, then wraps his arm around his wife's waist and leads her away. Lillian watches them go, then looks up at me. Sorry, they are fake? I answer for her. I can sense the bullshit behind the man's bleached white smile. Yes, very. She laughs and goes over and sits on the couch. I stand awkwardly by the door. Will your girlfriend mind if you're here, she asks me. I don't know, probably. I groan, running exasperated fingers through my hair. Would you want her to do the same thing? How would you feel if she was hanging out with a guy, one she just met? As soon as the words leave her lips, Anger swells in my chest. I'd be seeing red, I growl. Thought so. She smirks and pats the couch next to her. I take a deep breath and stride over to sit on the opposite side of the couch from her. I'm not sure how to read her, 
She's rude as hell and a little annoying. You're the jealous type, then, she asks, eyes wide. I guess so. I shrug. I bet your girlfriend wouldn't like it much, if you kissed me. She moves closer, and I jump up from the couch. I'm halfway to the door, before she begins to laugh. What the hell? I try to keep my voice down. I was just messing with you. I'm not interested, trust me. She smiles. And it's a relief, to know that you aren't either. Now sit. She may have a lot of the same traits as Tessa, but she isn't as sweet nor as innocent. I sit down on the chair across from the couch. I don't know this chick enough to trust her. I'm only here, because I don't want to face what's back at my dad's cabin. And Lillian, despite being a stranger, is a neutral third party, unlike Landon, who happens to be Tessa's best friend. It's sort of nice to have someone to talk to who doesn't have a reason to judge me. And hell, she's a little nutty, so she's more likely to get where I'm coming from. Now tell me what is in Seattle that you aren't willing to face for her? It's not anything specific. I do have some bad history there, but it's more than that. It's the fact that she'll be thriving, I respond, knowing how fucking insane I sound. But I don't give a fuck, this girl stalked me for an hour, so if anyone is insane, it's her. And that's a bad thing? No. I want her to thrive, of course. I just want to be a part of it. I sigh, missing Tessa desperately, even though it's only been a few hours. The fact that she's so angry with me makes me miss her even more. So you refuse to go to Seattle with her, because you want to be involved in her life? It doesn't make sense, she says, stating the obvious. I know you don't get it, she doesn't either, but she's the only thing I have. Literally, she's the only thing in my life that I give a shit about, and I can't lose her. I'd have nothing without her. Why am I telling her this shit? I know I sound fucking pathetic. No, you don't. She gives me a sympathetic smile, and I look away. The last thing I want is sympathy. The light on the staircase shuts off, and I look back at Lillian. Should I go? I ask. No, I'm sure my father is ecstatic that I brought you home, she says, no sarcasm in her voice. Why is that? Well, ever since I introduced them to Riley, he's been hoping we would break up. He doesn't like him or some shit. Her. What? He doesn't like her, she says, and I almost smile at her. I feel bad for her father not accepting her relationship, but I have to admit I'm extremely relieved. Chapter 32. Tessa. Landon's been explaining that since their apartment is so close to campus, they can walk there easily every day. No need to drive, and he won't even have to take the subway on a daily basis. Well, I'm just glad you won't be driving in that massive city. Thank goodness, Karen says, putting her hand on her son's shoulder. He shakes his head. I'm a fine driver, better than Tessa, he teases. I'm not that bad, better than Hardin, I remark. There's something to brag about, Landon says playfully. And it's not your driving I'm worried about. It's those insane taxis. Karen says, like a mother hen. I grab a cookie off the plate on the counter and look at the front door again. I've been watching it, waiting for Hardin to return. My anger has been slowly shifting to concern as the minutes tick by. Okay, thanks for letting me know. I'll see you tomorrow, Ken says into his phone as he joins us in the kitchen. Who is that? Max. Hardin's at their cabin with Lillian, he says, and my stomach drops. Lillian? I can't stop myself from asking. Max's daughter. She's about your age. Why would Hardin be at the neighbor's cabin with their daughter? Does he know her? Has he dated her? He'll be back soon, I'm sure. Ken frowns, and when he looks at me, I get the feeling he hadn't considered my reaction to this information before he said it. That he seems uncomfortable makes me even more uncomfortable. Yeah, I choke, standing from the stool at the counter. I'm just I'm going to go to bed, I tell them, trying to hold myself together. I can feel my anger resurfacing, and I need to get away from them before it boils over. I'll come up with you, Landon offers. No, I'm okay, really. I had an early morning, we all did, and it's getting late, I assure him, and he nods even though I can tell he isn't buying it. As I reach the stairs I hear him say, 
He's a damn idiot. Yes, Landon. Yes, he is. I closed the balcony doors before walking over to the dresser to change into my pajamas. With my mind racing, I'm finding it difficult to focus on clothing. Nothing appeals as a substitute for Hardin's worn clothing, and I refuse to wear the white t-shirt resting on the arm of the chair. I need to be able to sleep in my own damn clothes. I give up after rummaging through the drawer and decide to settle for the shorts and sweatshirt that I have on and lie down on the bed. Who is this mystery girl that Hardin's with? Ironically, I'm more upset about my apartment in Seattle than I am about her. If he wants to jeopardize our relationship by cheating, that's his choice. Yes, it would tear what's left of me into pieces, and I don't think I would ever recover, but I'm not going to focus on it. For the life of me, I can't picture it. I can't picture him actually cheating on me. Despite all of the things he's done in the past, I just don't see it. Not after his letter, not after his pleading for my forgiveness. Yes, he's controlling, too controlling, and he doesn't know when to stop interfering with my life, but the intentions behind his actions are more about keeping me near him than trying to escape, like cheating would be. Even after I've spent an hour staring at the ceiling and counting the beams of stained wood lining the sloped surface, the throb of resentment toward Hardin hasn't let up. I don't know if I'm ready to talk to him just yet, but I know I won't be able to sleep until I hear him return. The longer he's gone, the stronger the twist of jealousy grows in my chest. I can't help but notice the double standard here. If I was out with a guy, Hardin would lose it and probably try to burn down the woods surrounding the place. I want to laugh at the ridiculous thought, but I just don't have it in me. Instead I close my eyes again, begging sleep to come. Chapter 33. Hardin. Do you want a drink? Lillian asks. Sure. I shrug and glance at the clock. She gets up and goes over to a silver bar cart. Looking at the bottles it contains, she selects one and shows it to me quickly, like she's Vanna White or something. Pulling the top off of a bottle of brandy that I'm sure cost more than the massive television hanging on the wall, she looks back at me with mock sympathy. You can't be a coward forever, you know. Shut up. You're so much like her. She giggles. Like Tessa? No, I'm not. And how would you know? No, not Tessa. Riley. How's that? Lillian pours the dark liquor into a curved glass and places it in my hand before sitting back down on the couch. Where's your drink? I ask. She gives a regal shake of the head. I don't drink. Of course she doesn't. I really shouldn't be drinking, but the slightly sweet, intense aroma of the brandy pushes the nagging reminder away. Are you going to tell me how I'm like her or not? I look at her expectantly. You just are. She has that brooding, angry at the world thing going on too. She makes an exaggerated emo face and crosses her legs under her. Well, maybe she has something to be angry about, I say defending her girlfriend without even knowing her, then gulp down half the glass of liquor. It's strong, aged to perfection, and I can feel the burn down to the soles of my boots. Lillian doesn't reply. Instead she purses her lips and stares at the wall behind me, deep in thought. I'm not into this whole Dr. Phil, you talk I talk, Kambaya shit, I tell her, and she nods. I'm not expecting Kambaya but I think you should at least come up with a plan to apologize to Tamara. Her name is Tessa, I snap, annoyed suddenly by her small mistake. She smiles and pulls her brown hair to one shoulder. Tessa, sorry. I have a cousin named Tamara, and it was in my head, I guess. What makes you assume I'll be apologizing, anyway? I click my tongue against the roof of my mouth, while waiting for her response. You're kidding, right? Do you owe her an apology, she says loudly. You need to at least, tell her you'll go to Seattle with her. I groan. I'm not going to Seattle, for fuck's sake. What is it with Tessa and fucking Tessa number two, and pestering me over Seattle? Well, then I hope she goes without you, she says curtly. I look at her, this girl who I thought might understand. What did you say? I put the brandy glass down on the table quickly sloshing brown liquid onto its white surface. Lillian arches one brow. I said I hope she does go, because you try to mess up her apartment deal, 
and still aren't willing to move with her. Good thing I don't give a fuck what you think. I stand to leave. I know she's right, but I'm over this bullshit. Yes, you do, you just won't admit it. I have come to learn that the people who pretend to care the least actually care the most. I pick the glass back up and finish it off before heading toward the door. You don't know shit about me, I say through my teeth. Lillian gets up and pads over to me casually. Yes, I do. Like I said, you're just like Riley. Well, I feel sorry for her, because she has to put up I begin to lash out at the girl but stop myself. She hasn't done anything wrong. She's actually been trying to help me and doesn't deserve my anger. I sigh. Sorry, okay? I walk back into the living room, plopping myself back onto the couch. See, apologizing isn't so hard, is it? Lillian smiles and goes over to the silver bar, bringing the brandy over to where I sit. You obviously need another drink. She smiles and grabs my empty glass. After my third glass, I mumble, Tessa hates when I drink. Are you a mean drunk? No, I say reflexively. But seeing that she's really interested, I ponder the question some more and reconsider. Sometimes. Why don't you drink? I ask. I don't know, I just don't. Does your boy if I begin but correct myself, girlfriend drink? She nods. Yes, sometimes. Not as much as before. Oh. This Riley and I may have more in common than I thought. Lillian, her father calls out, and then I hear the staircase creak. I sit up and move away from her out of instinct, and she turns her attention to him. Yes, father? It's nearly one in the morning. I think it's time your company heads out, he says. One in the morning? Holy shit. Okay. She nods and looks back to me. He seems to forget I'm an adult, she whispers, annoyance clear in her voice. I need to go anyway. Tess is going to kill me, I gripe. When I stand, my legs aren't as steady under me as they should be. You're welcome to come back tomorrow, Hardin, my father's friend says as I reach the door. Just apologize and consider Seattle, Lillian reminds me. But I'm determined to ignore her, and I walk out the door, down the steps, and onto the paved driveway. I would really love to know what her dad does for a living, he's obviously rich as fuck. It's pitch black out here. Literally, I can barely see my hand as I wave it idiotically in front of my face. When I reach the end of the driveway, the lights outside my father's cabin come into view, and they guide me to his driveway and up the porch steps. The screen door creaks when I open it, and I curse at it. The last thing I need is my father waking up and smelling the brandy on my breath. Then again, he may want some himself. My inner Tessa immediately scolds me for the cynical thought, and I pinch the bridge of my nose, shaking my head to get her out. I nearly knock over a lamp trying to pull my boots off of my feet. I grip the corner of the wall to steady myself and finally manage to place my boots next to Tessa's shoes. My palms begin to sweat as I take the staircase as slowly as possible. I'm not drunk, but I am quite buzzed, and I know she's going to be even more upset than she was before. She was downright cheesed the fuck off earlier, and now that I've stayed out this long, and have been drinking, she's going to lose it. I'm actually a little afraid of her right now. She was so mad earlier, cursing at me, and ordering me away. The door to the room we're sharing opens with a small squeak, and I try to be as quiet as possible and guide myself through the dark room without waking her. No such luck. The lamp on the nightstand switches on, and Tessa's impassive glare is focused on me. Sorry I didn't want to wake you, I apologize. A frown forms on her full lips. I wasn't asleep, she states, and my chest begins to tighten. I know it's late, I'm sorry, I say, my words running together. She squints. Have you been drinking? Despite her expression, her eyes are bright. The way the soft light of the lamp hits her face makes me want to reach across the bed and touch her. Yes, I say and wait for the fury of my very own Lissa. She sighs and brings her hands to her forehead to brush the loose tendrils that have escaped her ponytail. She doesn't seem to be alarmed or surprised by my state. Thirty seconds later, I'm still waiting on the rage. But nothing. She's just sitting there on the bed, leaning back on her arms, 
staring at me with despondent eyes, while I stand awkwardly in the center of the room. Are you going to say anything? I finally ask, hoping to break this haunting silence. No, I'm not. Huh? I'm exhausted and you're drunk. There's really nothing for me to say, she says without emotion. I'm always nervously anticipating her to finally snap, to finally get to the point where she's tired of putting up with my shit, and honestly, I'm scared to fucking death that this may be it. I'm not drunk, I only had three drinks. You know that's not shit to me, I say and sit on the edge of the bed. A chill runs down my spine when she moves closer to the headboard to get away from me. Where were you? Her voice is soft. Next door. She continues to stare at me, expecting more information. I was with this girl Lillian, her dad went to college with mine, and we were talking one thing led to another and, oh god. Tessa's eyes snap shut, and her hands move to cover her ears as she pulls her knees up to her chest. I reach across, taking both her wrists in one hand, and gently pushing them down to her lap. No, no, not like that. Fuck. We were talking about you, I tell her, then wait for her normal eye rolling, and signs of disbelief at anything I tell her. She opens her eyes and looks up. What about me? Just this Seattle shit. You talk to her about Seattle, but you won't talk to me? Tessa's voice isn't angry, just curious, and I'm really fucking confused. It's not like I wanted to talk to the girl, she practically fucking forced me, but in a way I guess I'm sort of glad she did. It's not like that, you made me leave, I remind the girl in front of me with Tessa's face, but none of her normal attitude. And you were with her this entire time? Her lip trembles, and she presses her teeth into it. No, I went for a walk, and ran into her. I reach across to move her unruly hair away from her cheek, and she doesn't pull away. Her skin is hot to my touch, and her cheeks look as if they're glowing in the muted light. She leans into my palm, and her eyes flutter closed as I rub my thumb along her cheekbone. She's a lot like you. This isn't how I expected this to go. I expected World War fucking Tessa by now. Do you like her, then, she asks, gray eyes opening slightly to meet mine. Yeah, she's okay. I shrug, and she closes her eyes again. I'm thrown off by her calm behavior, and that mixed with the aged brandy makes for one confused Harden. I'm tired, she says and reaches up to remove my hand from her cheek. You're not mad? I question. Something is nagging at the back of my mind, but it just won't surface. Fucking liquor. I'm just tired, she answers and lies back against the pillows. Okay warning bells no, fucking tornado sirens go off in my mind at the lack of emotion in her voice. There's something she's not saying. And I want her to just say it. But as she falls back asleep, or at least feigns it, and I realize I have to choose to ignore the silent signals for tonight. It's late. If I push her too hard, she'll make me leave again, and I can't have that. I can't sleep without her, and I'm thankful she's even fucking letting me near her after the shit with Sandra. I'm also thankful the liquor is making me so drowsy that I won't be up all night worrying about what's doing inside of Tessa's brain. Chapter 34 Tessa. The morning light sweeps over the room as the sun rises in the distance. My eyes move from the uncovered balcony doors to my stomach, where Hardin's arm is draped over my body. His full lips are parted, soft purrs sounding from between them. I don't know whether I should shove him off the bed or brush his brown hair back from his forehead and press my lips against the reddened skin. I'm angry, so damn angry at Hardin for everything that happened last night. He had the audacity to return to the cabin at 1.30 in the morning, and just like I feared, his breath was laced with liquor. Yet another strand in this tangled web. Then there's this girl, a girl like me, whom he spent hours upon hours with. He said they were just talking, and it's not that I don't believe that they were only talking. It's the fact that Hardin refuses to discuss Seattle or anything remotely related to Seattle with me, but he seems to be able to talk to her. I don't know what to think, and I'm sick of thinking all the damn time. There's always some problem to fix, some argument to be gotten through. And I'm tired. Tired of all of it. I love Hardin more than I can comprehend, but I don't know how much longer I can do this. 
I can't worry about him coming home drunk every time we have a problem. I wanted to scream at him, throw a pillow at his face, and tell him how big of a jerk he is, but I'm finally beginning to realize that you can only fight with someone over the same thing so many times before you're burned out. I don't know what to do about him not coming to Seattle, but I do know that lying here in this bed isn't of any help to me. I lift Hardin's arm and wriggle out from under his weight, gently placing his arm across the pillow next to him. He groans in his slumber, but thankfully he only stirs and doesn't wake. I grab my phone from the bedside table and quietly pad to the balcony doors. They open with minimal noise, and I let out a relieved sigh before closing them behind me. The air is much cooler than yesterday, granted, it's only 7 in the morning. Phone in hand, I begin to ponder my living situation in Seattle, which at this point is non-existent. My transfer to Seattle is becoming more of a hassle than I ever anticipated, and honestly, at times it seems more of a hassle than it's worth. I immediately scold myself for entertaining the thought. That's exactly what Hardin is trying to do. He's trying to make it as difficult for me to move as he possibly can, hoping that I'll give up on doing what I want to do and stay with him. Well, that's just not going to happen. I open the browser on my phone and wait impatiently for Google to load. I stare at the small screen, waiting for the annoying circle to stop going round and round. Frustrated at the slow response on my ancient phone, I tread back into the bedroom and grab Hardin's off of the chair then go back out to the balcony. If he wakes up and finds me on his phone, he'll be angry. But I'm not going through his calls or texts. I'm only using his internet. Yeah, she's okay. His words about this Lillian girl play through my mind as I try to search for apartments in Seattle. I shake my head, disposing of the memory and instead admiring a luxury apartment that I wish I could afford. I scroll to the next a smaller one-bedroom in a duplex. I don't feel comfortable in a duplex. I like the idea of someone having to go through a lobby to get to my door, especially since it appears that I'll be alone in Seattle. I swipe my finger across the screen a few more times before finally finding a one-bedroom in a mid-size high-rise. It's over my budget, but not by much. If I have to go without being able to buy groceries until I get settled in, I will. I enter the phone number into my phone and continue to browse through the listings. Impossible thoughts of searching for an apartment alongside Hardin's haunt me. The two of us would be sitting on the bed, me cross-legged, Hardin with his long legs stretched out in front of him and his back against the headboard. I would show him apartment after apartment and he'd roll his eyes and complain about the process of apartment hunting, but I'd catch him smiling with his eyes focused on my lips. He'd tell me how cute I am when I'm flustered, before taking the laptop from me and assuring me he'd find the place for us. That would be too simple, though. Too easy. Everything in my life was simple and easy until six months ago. My mother helped me with my dorm, and I had everything sorted and in order before I even arrived at Washington Central. My mother I can't help but miss her. She has no idea that I've reunited with my father. She'd be so angry if she knew. I know she would. Before I can talk myself out of it, I'm dialing her number. Hello, she answers smoothly. Mother? Who else would it be? I'm already regretting this phone call. How are you? I ask quietly. She sighs. I'm good. I've been a little busy with everything going on. Pots and pans clank in the background. What's going on? Does she know about my father? I quickly decide that if she doesn't, now isn't the time to tell her. Nothing specific, really. I've been working a lot of overtime, and we got a new pastor, oh, and Ruth passed away. Ruth Porter? Yes, I was going to call you, she says, her cold voice warming slightly. Noah's grandmother Ruth was one of the sweetest women I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. She was always so kind, and next to Karen, she made the best chocolate chip cookies on the planet. How's Noah doing? I dare to ask. He was very close with his grandmother, and I know this has to be hard for him. I never had the chance to get close to any of my grandparents. My father's parents passed away before I was old enough to remember, and my mother's parents were not the type of people to allow anyone to get close to them. 
He's taking it pretty hard. You should call him, Tessa. I, I begin to tell her that I can't call him, but I stop myself. Why can't I call him? I can and I will. I will I'll call him right now. Really? The surprise is evident in her voice. Well, at least wait until after nine, she advises, and I can't help but smile at her tone. I know she's smiling on the other end of the line. How's school going? I'm leaving Monday for Seattle, I confess, and I hear something clatter to the ground. What? I told you, remember? I did, didn't I? No, you didn't. You mentioned that your company was moving there, but you never told me that you were leaving for certain. I'm sorry, I've just been so busy with Seattle and Hardin. Her voice is incredibly controlled when she asks, he's going with you? I'm I don't know. I sigh. Are you okay? Do you sound upset? I'm okay, I lie. I know we haven't been on the best of terms lately, but I'm still your mother, Tessa. You can talk to me if something is going on in your life. I'm fine, really. I'm just stressed over this move and transferring to a new campus. Oh, that? You'll do great there, you'd excel at any campus. You can excel anywhere, she says with assurance. I know, but I'm already so used to this campus and I got to know a few of the professors and I have friends of you friends. I don't really have friends that I will miss terribly, save Landon. And maybe Steph, but mostly only Landon. Tessa, this is what we've been working toward for years, and look at you now, in such a short period of time you've accomplished it. You should be proud of yourself. I'm surprised by her words, and my mind rushes to process them. Thank you, I mutter. Tell me as soon as you move into your place in Seattle, so I can come visit, since you obviously won't be coming home anytime soon, she says. I will. I ignore her harsh tone. I'll have to call you back. I have to get ready for work. Make sure you don't forget to call Noah. I know, I'm going to call him in a couple hours. As I hang up, a movement on the balcony catches my attention and I look up to see Hardin. He's dressed now in his normal black t-shirt and black jeans. His feet are bare, and his eyes are focused on me. Who is that, he asks. My mother, I respond and pull my knees up to my chest in the chair. Why did she call? He grabs the back of the empty chair, and it squeaks as he pulls it closer to me before sitting down. I called her, I answer without looking at him. Why is my phone out here? He grabs it from my lap and scans it. I was using the internet. Oh, he says as if he doesn't believe me. If he doesn't have anything to hide, why would he care? Who are you talking about when you said you were going to call him, he asks, sitting on the edge of the hot tub. I look over at him. Noah, I respond dryly. His eyes narrow. Like hell you are. Well, I am. Why do you need to talk to him? He places his hands on his knees and leans forward. You don't. So you can spend hours with someone else and come back drunk, but, he's your ex-boyfriend, he interrupts. And how do I know she isn't one of your ex-girlfriends? Because I don't have any ex-girlfriends, remember? I huff in frustration, my earlier resolve has now faded, and I'm getting angry again. Okay, all the girls you fucked around with, then. In any case, I continue, my voice low and clear, you don't get to tell me who I am allowed to call. Ex-boyfriend or not. I thought you weren't mad at me. I sigh, staring out onto the water and away from his piercing green eyes. I'm not, I'm really not. You did exactly what I expected you to do. Which was running off for hours, then returning with liquor on your breath. You told me to leave. That doesn't make it okay that you came back drunk. And here it is, he groans. I knew you wouldn't stay quiet like you did last night. Stay quiet? See, that's your problem. You expect me to stay quiet. I'm over it. Over what? He leans toward me, his face too close to mine. This I wave my hand dramatically and rise to my feet. I'm just over all of it. You go ahead and do whatever the hell you want, but you can find someone else to sit here beside you and not take note of your antics and remain quiet because I'm not doing it anymore. I turn away from him. He jumps to his feet and hooks his fingers around my arm to gently pull me back. Stop, he orders. One large hand spreads across my waist, 
while the other goes to my arm. I think about twisting free, but then he pulls me to his chest. Stop fighting me, you're not going anywhere. His lips press into a hard line as I pull my arm from his grasp. Let me go, and I'll sit down, I huff. I don't want to give in, but I also refuse to ruin anyone else's time on this trip. If I go downstairs, Hardin will surely follow, and we'll end up staging a big blowout in front of his family. He swiftly lets go of me, and I plop myself into the chair again. He sits back down across from me, and stares at me expectantly with his elbows on his thighs. What? I snap. So you're leaving me, then, he whispers, which softens my harsh demeanor a little. If you mean leaving to Seattle, yes. Monday? Yes, Monday. I've gone over this with you again and again. I knew you thought that little stunt you pulled would discourage me, I say, seething, but it didn't, and nothing you can do will. Nothing? He looks up at me through his thick lashes. I'll marry you, he told me, while he was drunk. Does he mean it now? As much as I want to ask him right here, right now, I can't. I don't think I'm ready for his sober answer. Hardin, what is it in Seattle that you're so eager to avoid? I ask instead. His eyes dart away from mine. Nothing important. Hardin, I swear, if there's something that you've kept from me, I will never speak to you again, I say, and mean it. I've had enough of this shit, honestly. It's nothing, Tessa. I have some old friends there that I don't particularly care for because they're part of my old life. Old life? My life before you, the drinking, the parties, fucking every girl that passed my way, he says. When I cringe, he mumbles sorry but continues. There's no big secret, just bad memories. But that's not why I don't want to go, anyway. I wait for him to get to the heart of the matter, but he doesn't say anything else. Okay then tell me why. Because I don't get it. His face is devoid of any emotion as he looks into my eyes. Why do you need an explanation? I don't want to go, and I don't want you to go without me. Well, that's not enough of an explanation. I'm going, I say and shake my head. And you know what? I don't want you to come with me anymore. What? His eyes darken. I don't want you to come. I stay as calm as possible and stand up from the chair. I'm proud of myself for having this discussion without yelling. You've tried to ruin this for me, this has been my dream, since I can remember, and you tried to ruin it for me. You've turned something that I should be looking forward to into something that I can barely stand. I should be excited and ready to go meet my dreams. But instead you've made sure I have nowhere to live and no support system at all. So no, I don't want you to go. His mouth opens and closes, before he stands, and paces across the wooden deck. Do he begins, but then stops himself, looking like he's reconsidering his thoughts. But being hardened, things never change, and he chooses the harder uglier path instead. Do you know what, Tessa? No one gives a fuck about Seattle except someone like you. Who the hell grows up planning on moving to Seattle fucking Washington? Real ambitious, he growls. He takes in a deep, violent breath. And in case you forgot, I'm the only reason you have that opportunity to begin with. You think anyone else is getting a paid fucking internship as a freshman in college? Fuck, no. Most people struggle to get a paid internship, even after they graduate. That's not even close to the fucking point here. I roll my eyes at him, and the nerve he has. Then what is the point, you ungrateful? I take a step toward him and my hand flies at him before I really register what I'm doing. But hardens too quick and grabs me by the wrist, stopping me only inches from his cheek. Don't, he warns. His voice is rough, laced with anger, and I wish he hadn't stopped me from slapping him. His minty breath fans across my cheeks as he tries to control his temper. Bring it on, Hardin, my thoughts challenge. I'm not intimidated by his harsh breathing, or his foul words. I can give them back to him in spades. You don't get to talk to people like that without consequences. My words come out low, threatening even. Consequences? He stares down at me with burning eyes. I've known nothing in my life but consequences. I hate the way he's taking credit for my internship, I hate the way he pushes when I pull, 
and I push when he pulls. I hate the way he drives my anger to grow so strong that I would try to slap him, and I hate the way I feel as if I'm losing control of something I'm not sure I've ever held. I look up at him, his hand still holding my wrist, using only enough pressure to keep me from attempting to slap him again, and he looks hurt, in a dangerous way. There's a challenge behind his eyes that makes my stomach turn. He brings my hand to his chest, his eyes never leaving mine, and says, you know nothing of consequences. Then he walks away from me, that look still in his eyes, and my hand drops down to my side. Chapter 35. Harden. Who the fuck does she think she is? She thinks just because I don't want to go to Seattle with her, that she can say shit like this to me? She doesn't want me to fucking go? She fucking uninvited me to Seattle, and she's the one trying to slap me? I don't fucking think so. I was only seeing red as I spoke, and her trying to hit me surprised me, a lot. I left her with white eyes, her pupils blown in rage, but I had to get as far from that bullshit as I could. I find myself at the small coffee shop in town. The coffee tastes like tar, and the weird-ass muffin I got is even worse. I hate this bullshit small town, and its lack of every goddamn thing. I tear three sugar packets at once, and dump them into the disgusting coffee, stirring it with a plastic spoon. It's too early for this shit. Good morning, a familiar voice greets. Not the voice I wanted to hear, though. Why are you here? I roll my eyes, and ask Lillian as she comes around from behind me. Well, you obviously aren't a morning person, she says saccharinely, and takes the seat in front of me. Go away, I huff and look around the small cafe. The line has formed nearly to the door, and almost all of the tables are full. I should probably do everyone in line a favor, and tell them to find a fucking Starbucks, because this place blows. She eyes me. You didn't apologize did you? God, you are so damn nosy. I pinch the bridge of my nose, and she smiles. Are you going to finish that? She gestures to the rock-hard muffin in front of me. I slide it over to her, and she tears off a piece. I wouldn't eat that, I warn, but she does anyway. It's not that bad, she lies. I can tell she wants to spit it out, but instead she swallows it down. So are you going to tell me why you didn't apologize to Tamara? Her fucking name is Tessa, if you call her, whoa, calm down. Joke, joke. I was just messing with you. She giggles, proud of her annoying self. Ha. Ha. I down the rest of my coffee. Anyway, why didn't you? I don't know. Yes, you do, she presses. Why do you care, anyway? I lean toward her, and she sits. Back in the chair. I don't know, because you seem to love her and you're my friend. Dear friend? I don't even know you, and you sure as hell don't know me, I declare. Her neutral expression falters for a moment, and she blinks her eyes slowly. If she cries, I'm going to pun someone. I can't handle this much drama this early in the fucking morning. Look, you're cool and all. But this, I gesture back and forth between her body and mine, isn't a friendship. I don't have friendships. She tilts her head to the side, you don't have any friends? Not even one? No, I have people I party with in Tessa. You should have friends, at least one. What would be the point of you and me being friends? We're only here until tomorrow afternoon. She shrugs. We could be friends until then. You obviously don't have any friends either. Not many. Riley doesn't seem to like them. And why does that matter? Because I don't want to start a fight with her so I just don't hang out with them much. Sorry, but Riley sounds like a bitch. Don't say that about her. Lillian's cheeks flush, and for the first time, since I met her, she's exhibiting an emotion besides calmness or omniscience. I play with my cup smoothly, kind of glad to get a rise out of her. Just saying. I wouldn't let someone tell me who I can and can't be friends with. So you're telling me that Tessa has friends she hangs out with besides you? She raises her brow, and I look away, to think about her question. She has friends she has Landon. Yes. You don't count. No, not me. Landon. Landon is your stepbrother. He doesn't count. Steph is sort of Tessa's friend but not really, and Zed not a problem anymore. 
She has me, I say. She smirks. That's exactly what I thought. What does it matter? Once we get away from here and start over, she can make new friends. We can make new friends together. Sure. The problem is that you aren't going to the same place, she reminds me. She'll come with me. I know it doesn't seem like it, but you don't know her. I do, and I know she can't live without me. Lillian looks up at me with thoughtful eyes. You know, there's a big difference between not being able to live without someone and loving them. This chick doesn't even know what she's talking about, she makes no sense. I don't want to talk about her anymore. If we're going to be friends, I need to know about you and Regan. Riley, she says sharply. I chuckle lightly. Annoying, isn't it? Lillian glowers playfully at me, but then tells me all about how she met her girlfriend. They were partnered up together for Lillian's freshman orientation. Riley had been rude at first, but later made a move on her, surprising both of them. Apparently this Riley has a jealous streak and a temper. Sounds familiar. Most of our fights stem from her jealousy. She's always afraid that I'll stray from her. I don't know why, because she's the one always getting attention from everyone, male and female, and she's dated both. She sighs. So it's sort of like everyone's fair game. You haven't? No, I've never dated a guy. She crinkles her nose. Well, once in eighth grade, because I felt like I had to. My friends were hassling me for never having a boyfriend. Why didn't you just tell them? I ask her. It's not that simple. It should be. She smiles. Yes, it should be. But it's not. Anyway. I've never dated anyone except Riley and one other girl. Then her smile. Disappears. Riley's dated a lot. The rest of my morning and the entire afternoon is spent this way, listening to this girl's problems. I don't mind as much as I thought, though. It's nice to know I'm not the only one with these types of issues. Lillian reminds me a lot of Tessa and Landon. If they were morphed into one person, it would certainly be Lillian. I hate to admit it but I don't mind her company too much. She's an outsider, like me, but she doesn't judge me, because she barely knows me. Strangers come and go, in and out of the coffee shop, and each time a blonde steps in, I can't help but look up, hoping it will be my blonde stranger. A funny little tune starts to play. That would be my dad calling Lillian says, and looks down at her phone. Shit, it's almost five, she says, panicked. We need to go. Well, I need to go. I still don't have anything to wear tonight. For what? I ask her when she stands up. Dinner. You knew we were going to dinner with your parents, didn't you? Karen isn't my I begin, but decide to let it go. She knows. I get up and follow her down the block to a small clothing store filled with colorful dresses and gaudy jewelry. It smells like mothballs and salt water. There's nothing to choose from, she groans, holding up a bright pink frilly dress. That's hideous, I tell her, and she nods, hanging it back up. I can't help, but think of what Tessa is doing right now. Is he wondering where I am? I'm sure she assumes that I'm with Lillian, which is true, but she doesn't have anything to worry about. She knows this. Wait no, she doesn't. I haven't told her about Lillian's girlfriend. Tessa doesn't know you're gay, I blurt as she shows me a black beaded dress. She looks at me smoothly and just sweeps her hand across the dress again, kind of like she did with the brandy bottle last night. I'm not giving you fashion advice here, so stop trying, I groan. She rolls her eyes. So why didn't you tell her? I poke at this feather necklace thing. I don't know, I didn't think about it. Well, I'm oh so flattered that my orientation was so unedible to you, she says with feigned gratitude and a spread hand at her neck. But you really should tell her. She smiles. No wonder she almost backhanded you. I knew I shouldn't have told her about the slap. Shut up. I'll tell her, although it might work in my favor not to, actually. Maybe, I add. Lillian rolls her eyes, again. She rolls her eyes almost as much as Tessa does. She's difficult and I know what I'm doing, okay? I think I do, at least. I know exactly how to push her buttons to get what I want. You need to dress up tonight. The place we're going is disgustingly fancy, she warns me, 
while eyeing the dress with a twist of the hanger. Hell no, I'm not. What makes you think I'm going, anyway? Why not? Do you want to make the missus a little less pissed off, don't you? The sound of her words throws me off for a moment. The missus's? Don't call her that. She slaps a white button up against my chest. Just wear a nice shirt at least, otherwise my dad will give you shit about it all night, she says and steps into the dressing room. A few minutes later she comes out in the black dress. It looks good on her, she's hot and all, but I immediately start fantasizing about how Tessa would look in it. It would be much tighter, Tessa's boobs are much bigger than Lillian's, Tessa's hips are a little wider, so she would fill the dress much better. It's not as ugly as the rest of the shit in here, I half compliment, and she closes the curtain with, yet another eye roll and a middle finger. Chapter 36. Tessa. I stare into the long mirror and ask Landon, are you sure this looks okay? Yes, it's fine, he says with a smile. Can we try to remember that I'm a guy, though? I sigh, then chuckle. I know. I'm sorry. It's not my fault you're my only friend. The dark sparkly dress feels odd against my skin. The material is hard, and the small beads scratch me a little when I move. The small clothing boutique in town didn't have much to choose from, and I surely wasn't going to pick the hot pink dress made entirely of tall. I need something to wear to this dreaded dinner tonight, and Hardin's suggestion that I wear jeans isn't going to work. Do you think he'll even come back before it's time to leave? I ask Landon. Hardin took off, as always, after our fight, and hasn't been back since. He hasn't called or texted either. He's probably with a mystery girl with whom he loves to discuss our problems. You know, the girl he can talk to better than he can talk to his own girlfriend. In his anger, I wouldn't be surprised if he did something with her to spite me. No he wouldn't. I don't know, honestly, Landon says. I hope he does. My mom will be disappointed if he doesn't. Yeah. I push another pin into my bun and grab my mascara off of the bathroom counter. He'll come around, he's just stubborn. I don't know if we will, though. I sweep the small brush across my lashes. I'm reaching my breaking point, I can feel it. Do you know what I felt last night when he told me he was with another girl? What? He stares blankly at me. I think this is just the end of the turbulent love story. I try to make a joke but it falls flat. It's weird hearing you say that, you of all people, he says. How are you feeling? A little angry, but that's it. It's like I'm numb to it now, to all of it. I just don't have it in me to keep doing this over and over. I'm beginning to think he's a lost cause, and that breaks my heart, I say, forbidding myself from crying. Nobody's a lost cause. They just think they are, so they don't even bother to try sometimes. Are you guys ready? Karen's voice calls from the living room, and Landon assures her that we'll be down any minute. I slide on my new pair of black heels with straps at the ankles. Unfortunately, they're as uncomfortable as they look. It's times like this that I miss wearing Toms every day. Hardin still hasn't returned by the time we pile into the car. We can't wait any longer, Ken says through a disappointed frown. It's fine. We can bring him something back, Karen sweetly offers, knowing that's not the solution, but trying her best to calm her husband's irritation. Landon looks over at me, and I offer a smile, to assure him that I'm fine. He tries to distract me the whole drive talking about various students we know, making little jokes about how they are in class. Especially some of the ones in the religion course. As Ken pulls up to our destination, I see that the restaurant is exquisite. The building is a massive log cabin, big enough to be a lodge, and the inside contradicts the woodsy feel of the exterior. It's modern and sleek, black and white everywhere, with grey accents along the walls and floor. The lighting is right on the verge of being too dark, but it adds to the atmosphere. Unexpectedly, my dress is the brightest thing in the room. When the light hits the glittering beads, they shine like diamonds in the dark, which everyone seems to notice. Scott, I hear Ken tell the beautiful woman behind the rostrum. The rest of your party is already here. She smiles, her perfect teeth white nearly to the point of blinding. Party? I turn to Landon, and he shrugs. We follow the woman to a table in the corner of the room. 
I hate the way everyone seems to be staring at me because of this dress. I should have gone with a hot pink monstrosity. It would have attracted less attention. A middle-aged man knocks over his drink as we walk by, and Landon pulls me closer to his side as we pass the creep. The dress isn't inappropriate. It rests just above my knees. The problem is that it was made for someone with a much smaller bust than me, causing the built-in bra to act as a push-up, giving me maximum cleavage. It's about time you joined us, an unfamiliar male voice says, and I peer around Karen to look for the source. The man, who I assume is Ken's friend, stands to shake his hand. My eyes move to his right, where his wife is smiling, greeting Karen. Next to her is a young girl, the girl, I sense on instinct, and my stomach drops. She's beautiful, extremely beautiful. And she's wearing the exact same dress as I am. Of course. I can see the bright blue of her eyes from here, and when she smiles at me, she's even more beautiful. I'm so distracted by my growing jealousy that I almost fail to notice that Hardin is sitting right next to her, dressed in a white button-down shirt. 